So I'll turn this over to the Planning Commission um, Chair, who uh, today is Rachel Dan. Good morning, Chair Dan. Good morning, Lizanne, thank you. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Um, Renee Shepard. Uh, here, thank you. Alison Violante. Here. Lisa Sheridan. Here. Judy Lazenby. We don't have Judy today. And Chair Dan. Here. Um, thank you. Before we move on to item two, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, have two newish um, commissioners in our meeting today. Alison Violante has actually been on our commission for um, quite some time as an alternate and Lisa Sheridan, who I believe this is her first meeting. So I would just ask very briefly if Allison and Lisa could introduce themselves and Allison is the more senior of the new members. Maybe you could go first. I'm of course happy to, thank you, Chair Dan. Um, so I was appointed about a year ago, as you mentioned, to the Planning Commission. I am an analyst for Supervisor Friend and I'm the point person on land use uh, issues. So uh, that's a little bit about me and um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me to introduce myself. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Lisa Sheridan, this is my second time. I think it's been a while, maybe a year since I joined you. Um, retired from a real estate career, lots of political activism, uh, environmental issues have always been a big concern for me. Great, thank you very much for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, can we move on to item two, additions and corrections to the agenda? Uh, yes, there's one change to today's agenda. Um, item seven, um, application 211280 has been removed from the agenda and this will be re-noticed for the July 13th hearing. Thank you. Um, is there any, uh, Item three is a declaration of ex parte communications. Is there anything commissioners would like to disclose at this time? Okay, seeing nothing, we can move on to item four, which is oral communications. This is the opportunity for any member of the public to address the commission on items that are not on today's agenda. Uh, Ms. Just, is there anyone waiting to do that? I'm not seeing anybody who has their hands raised, but uh, just again to remind you, if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on your home, on your Zoom link, or if you're calling in by phone to select star nine. I'm not seeing anyone. Are you seeing anyone, Mike? Okay, well, we're not seeing anybody. Okay, great. Let's move on to our consent item. Um, if anyone would like to discuss this item. Excuse me, Chair, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I, I do actually see a hand up uh, from the public. Oh, you do? Okay. Is you that do. Uh, and is, uh, yes, I do. I see someone who is phone number ends in 2915. Um, their hand, I do see their hand raised. I just oh. want to make sure we the public gets the chance to speak before we move on. Oh, you're right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Yes, it's, um, so if your phone number ending in 2915, uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. Good morning. If you would like uh, 2915, phone number 2915, you have your hand raised. I think they have to be taken out of the participants Oh. Um, status and be promoted to a temporary panelist. Yep, there they are. All right. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you now, thank you. Sorry oh, about that. excellent. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you to the commissioner. I think it was Commissioner Violante who pointed out that I was raising my hand repeatedly. So thank you very <laughs> much. Um, good morning, this is Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I, um, I have concerns that the public comment for the draft EIR of the county's sustainability plan closed on May 31st. I and a number of other people did request uh, an extension of public comment time, but I have received no notifications and I've not seen anything on the planning department website that public comment has been extended. 
I think it is unusual that public comment would close before your commission even reviews that document publicly. So I request that the Plan Commission send um, a letter or notification of some kind to the uh, planning department. I guess it's got a new name now, Redevelopment Commission or Department or something, to, ex to uh, reopen if it has closed the public comment for the draft EIR of the county's sustainability plan and general plan update um, and to extend it at least another 60 days. This is a huge document and it was released at the same time as the other, uh, the other portion of it, the sustainability plan and um, recommendations for regulate, regulatory changes. It is a huge amount for the public to try to grasp even with the public hearings, which were not well attended at all. And um, the document, the hard copy of that document did not even make it into the reference section of the Capitola Public Library until all of the public hearings had been held and there was really no opportunity for people to... Um, thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, and Ms. Ms. Jeffs, if I neglected to mention this, we have quite a long meeting today with many participants and I'd like to limit um, public comment to, or allow public comment for two minutes per, um, per person. Okay. And if we could put the timer up when they come up, that'd be great. Okay. okay. So is, is, is there anyone else for oral communication? I'm not seeing anybody else. Becky, your hand is still raised, but with nobody else. Okay, great. Um, and so let's move on to our consent item. If there's some, uh, if anyone wants to discuss this item, you have to make a request to pull it at this time. If not, uh, I will make a brief comment and thank um, Mr. Carlson for preparing the staff report on this item. This was something that I requested at a previous meeting um, based on some concerns about Puget is best for this project. So I just wanna I note my appreciation to uh, Mr. Carlson for looking into the matter and preparing the staff report for this consent item. There are no other comments. Um, uh, well, I don't want to slow things down, but can, and Michael, tell me if I'm wrong and I just missed it, but I didn't see any staff summary on that. Did I miss it? I mean, it was emailed to us. Uh, okay, I want to read it too, and I didn't. I won't slow things down today, but Michael, could I ask you the favor of sending it to me again? Yes, I will do that. Okay. If it meets Rachel's uh, approval, then I'm sure it will be me, but I follow it too, so I want to make sure I read it. Thank you. Cool. And I, and I also want to say, Dave, appreciate David, the time and effort he puts into all four issues, both past and present. <laughs> Good job. So I'll be looking for a motion. Uh, I'll move, uh, we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Megan, uh, Director Dan, but I, I didn't see a hand up and I want to ensure we take, I believe we have to take public comment even on the consent agenda. Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. So uh, Bill Henry, uh, can, you, can you please unmute yourself? Hmm. Bill, have we got Bill? How about now? You got me? Yeah, we got you. Hello. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I appreciate you taking my call on public comment. Uh, my name is Bill Henry. I'm a Davenport resident where I live there with my daughters and wife. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Carlson, for preparing staff summary. Um, overall, I'm supportive of remediation of the cement plant, but not at the expense of environmental and public health. Um, cement plants have long been associated with poor environmental quality, and the Davenport cement plant is no exception. Local activism dates back to reduce dust, dates back beyond the 1950s, with several successes, including um, installation of dust remediation equipment. Um, historical work. Um, at the plant has lacked dust control, such as the removal of the ball mill and demolition of a 12,000 square foot building and tear down of smokestacks that were 
um, in the plant proper. And during this period, there were no water activities to reduce dust. And I experienced um, dust in my lungs and burning my eyes and got no response from MBARD upon complaints. Um, I did submit a recent complaint and video of dust, dust de deposition on private properties and observations of these activities on of dust creating activities at the cement plant during the, during the CKD dust remediation um, and they lacked dust control for whatever reason. And I found the staff report was rather dismissive to some extent, but we need to have better dust control, especially um, with ongoing as ongoing remediation occurs. Um, off the cuff calculations show that based on the deposition that we witnessed, over 1.5 tons of dust were spread across federal lands, including Coho and Steelhead bearing San Vicente Creek. So that's important to the water board. Um, we need to have water on the moving blades of equipment and more use of dust control measures. Um, it's not acceptable. And we were told that dust would not be transported off, off site. And I know this is really hard, but we do have increased winds in the Davenport area and climate change are only gonna exacerbate that. So we need to make sure that we um, employ dust remediation activities and have a wind cutoff that is reasonable to decrease dust. I really appreciate you taking my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further comments? Not seeing anybody else. But then, um, <laughs> there are several more hands. I, I, I see. Yeah, I, the, the, the screen went to the timer, and I'm unable to see that right now. Um, there we go. All right, we have Celeste. Uh, Celeste, please unmute yourself. Hello. Oh, there we go. Good morning, Hi. Celeste. Good morning. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, okay. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz Gardens, and I wanted to speak to the change in zoning for the um, in the proposed general plan for the corner of Thurber and Soquel Drive. Excuse me, Celeste. I yes. think you're, you're making a comment on an item that is further along in our agenda. Oh, okay. So yeah, we're a little bit different than the board, so you have to wait. Oh, comes up with the item um, number 10. Okay. But thank you very much for being here and we'll we will get to that item. Yeah, okay. we'll call we'll call on you later, Celeste. Thank you. Thank so you. This, this is only for comments uh, regarding oh. consent item number five. Oh, okay. so Do we have other the comments I have a uh, Brian McElroy. Uh, McBrian if you're commenting on item number five, um, can you please unmute yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Good morning, Brian. State, please state your name for the record. Brian McElroy, resident of Newtown Davenport, 13 First Avenue. Um, I've followed this project from the very beginning and you know, appreciate all the effort and conversation there's been around dust, but I wanna reiterate Bill Henry's point that dust mitigation measures have not been adequate. Neighbors on San Vicente Road have dust in their homes, in their backyards. Um, and have been dealing with dust throughout this entire project. The air quality district had encouraged a wind speed limit on this project that was apparently not implemented as a mitigation measure. And I think that would have been critical because we, as Bill pointed out, we have had very high winds this spring and the project has been ongoing during those high winds. Um, I know this project is, getting close to complete um, and we're all looking forward to it being done. We all understand the need for this project and we all want it done. But I would encourage that the Planning Commission implement more stringent um, mitigation measures on dust control and that one of those measures should always include a wind speed limit and any future projects in the Davenport area associated with this men plant should have a wind speed limit on it. So please uh, let's 
take learning from this instance into future projects. Let's apply the learning we have now to the remainder of this project if possible, but primarily let's take our learning into new projects and let's have more stringent mitigation measures on dust control on any project related with the cement plant in Davenport. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Uh, do we have anybody else? Can we go back to the main screen, please? Uh, I have one other hand uh, raised. This is, um, again, phone number 2915. I believe that's Becky Steinbrenner. Could you please uh, press star six to unmute yourself, Becky? This is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Becky. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning again. I um, also want to second the comments before me about wind speed. I remember participating in this um, issue when it came before your commission. And I, I do remember that there was a lot of discussion about wind speed. One of the comments I made at that time that there be on site a uh, anemometer that would give objective data um, for determining the wind speed and that it be um, it be a, a determining factor when a project could move forward or not. I'm disappointed to, to hear that it is a problem. I'm concerned in the staff report that it's, it basically uh, dismisses the importance of this. It says it should be noted that any dust generation in the area is not necessarily going to be all AV. And I feel like that is uh, allowing this, this contractor to skate free. Any construction project has dust mitigation requirements. And it seems to me that this contractor is not being held accountable. I would like the commission to please contact their control resources board. It sounds like the residents had no luck or no response. Normally that agency is very responsive. So I would like your commission to follow up with the air quality control board on this issue for the protection of the health and safety of those who live near the site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I see no additional hands raised on this item. And if you did have your hand raised, could you please lower it so that we can um, <laughs> w um, and re then raise it again when you have further. Brian, you've already spoken, so. Well, Thank you. Uh, David, in, uh, is he here? Could he give maybe uh, a brief summary uh, of what he had to say about these issues? Yes, uh, David, good morning. Can you please uh, unmute yourself? Thanks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Morning, David. Um, okay, I mean, I can give a brief summary of my report. Um, contrary to what the last speaker just said, there is extensive dust monitoring and mitigation measures being implemented on this project. Um, and it's frustrating when people are able to get up and just say whatever they want about that. Um, without actually reading the report where it is listed uh, what all the act, uh, actions are being taken by the contractor. Uh, there's a uh, air quality monitoring system out there. There are anemometers um, taking wind speed measurements. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that in response to that last speaker um, that uh, frustrated me a little bit there. And then David, if I can just also add, um, I believe you've also been in communication with the contractor and with the air board, is that correct? Yes, I have been in contact with the contractor and the air board. Um, I was out there yesterday um, observing the, the status of the project. They're, they've got the CKD um, landfill at final grade and they are, um, well on their way to covering it with the geotextile fabric, which will um, eliminate the uh, 
CKD uh, dust issue with, with that covering. Um, they've also implemented some additional mitigation measures um, since the complaint came in and those are listed in the report as well. Um, I've provided the contact information for the on-site uh, staff uh, to the, uh, the complainant um, as well as that information going out on a weekly basis to um, some other community contacts. Uh, they've started earlier on the project um, at sunrise uh, to try to get as much uh, work done um, before the afternoon winds pick up. Um, they've increased their use of the soil binder material. That's this material, uh, it's the trade name of Gorilla Snot, and they, they spray it over the uh, ground and, and over a, uh, works over a period of you know several days to a week to bind the soil together and reduce dust generation. They've added a second water truck um, and uh, continue to um, monitor and collect data on dust generation from the monitoring network um, and also uh, monitor their activities with regard to the wind and, and actually have been shutting down the project um, at, at times when uh, it's difficult to work and, and uh, lots of dust is being generated. So. There have been um, a number of days actually uh, where the contractor has uh, on their own decision uh, shut down the project because of because of their high winds and, and the monitoring data that they're seeing and their visual observations. Um, so that's um, you know, a summary of my report. I, I have data from the monitoring network that I could present uh, if if that's uh, if, if folks want to see that. Um, it's long-term monitoring data of, of air quality um, during and before the project um, from the monitoring system that's on site and in the local Davenport community. Thank you, David. So, I mean, I just want to reiterate, we had some complaints. It was brought up. Um, I brought it up to staff. Staff diligently looked into it, communicated with the air board, with the contractor, came up with some additional mitigations. It's, you know, may not be perfect for the community, but um, but it was addressed. So, um, so I just want to, again, appreciate um, David looking into this and, and addressing um, the issues to the best of our ability. So thank you for that. Uh, are there any other questions or comments by commissioners? Well, do we want to ask David if he, Dave Carlson, uh, to, that he could make this report that we got available to others if they want to see it? Well, it is available on the Planning Commission website as part of our report back. So it is it is publicly available. That's just how the members of the public were able to read it in advance of today's meeting. Okay. So for anyone who's listening who spoke who didn't see the report, if you go to the Planning Commission website, you ought to be able to find it. It's fairly comprehensive. I just skimmed through it while everyone was talking. I think it's useful. So uh, just quickly, uh, so Chair Dan, um, since we have pulled this item um, on from the consent agenda and we are allowing public comment, I do see that one additional hand is raised. Do you want to take additional comment? Um, sure. Uh, this is a phone number starting in or ending in 9483. Um, please press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, phone number 9483. Can you press star six to unmute yourself, please, if you would like to provide comment on this item? Hi there. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Hi. Mary Lou Sams Wiley. I live over on Craven. I don't approve of them raising the height of this uh, tower and everything. Oh, else. And ex excuse, However, excuse, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, Mary, uh, we're taking comment on the item with regard to dust mitigation in Davenport. You'll have the opportunity to speak on this item later. Um, please, uh, okay. we'll just wait and we'll save your questions okay. for um, item eight on the agenda. Thank you. 
All right. Okay, sorry, I, I turned that. Going to close the public hearing on this item and then bring it back to the commission. If there are any comments from the commissioners? Yes, Mr. Sheridan. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. Um, just you know, not being as familiar with the process, will this come back again on the next agenda meeting so that there's some follow up from this commission on how um, things are going? No, actually, because this was an item that um, uh, two meetings ago, as a result of uh, some complaints we heard from the public, I made a motion at that meeting to have staff come and report to us on the status of the project and what additional mitigations uh, and communication could be had with the contractor and the air board um, about these complaints. So this is that report. Um, and kind of um, addressing the, the request of the commission. And so we've heard from them and unless there's a, a motion um, that would have it come back and that is approved, then this um, this is that report as responsive to the commission's request. Okay. I guess my question would also lead back to are the, is the community satisfied that these, that, that something's been done and are you satisfied that there's been progress on it? Well, I guess as I've indicated, um, it's a difficult project um, that um, is going to have um, um, issues with dust, no matter um, how you shake it. It's just any construction project is gonna have dust. Um, so I'm satisfied that um, that staff has uh, done what we asked them to do as a commission which is monitor the air quality in conformance with the law, uh, work with the contractor to, um, like David outlined, start earlier, end earlier to avoid the high winds, shut down when it's really windy. Um, and so, and I, I know that one member of the public indicated that they were told that no dust should leave the site, but that actually was not and never was a condition of approval because, you know, for any construction project, including this one, um, that's not something that um, that anybody can achieve, really. So, um, so yeah, there. Are, so, to answer your question, at this point, I'm satisfied. However, you know, the community um, doesn't hesitate to let us know um, when they feel that issues need to be addressed, and so I'm confident that should um, the issues with dust get worse or even just stay the same that we'll hear from them. And then we'll have an opportunity to work with staff and the contractor who also is you know, on notice that um, the community is um, activated on this issue. So I do feel that there's enough communication and um, um, with the community and with staff to be able to address um, issues that come up in the future should they get worse or yeah, should the contractor not do what um, they're supposed to be doing under the conditions of approval. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair Dan, I would just say that I really appreciate the work of Mr. Carlson on this item. It is um, simply a report back. It's an accept and file item. It's, it's not an action item on behalf of our commission. So I, I would make the motion that we accept and file the report um, on Mr. Carlson's extensive work, work for us. And I, I appreciate the work of Mr. Carlson. So I would, I would make the motion that we accept and file his report. Great, is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries four to nothing. Okay, let's move on to our first scheduled item, which is our minutes from the last planning commission meeting. Is there any discussion on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion? Actually, I'm sorry, I just have a question um, in, in the, um, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I do actually have a little bit of discussion. I would ask the commission to consider that we move procedurally to have our minutes be on the consent agenda in the future. I see no reason um, that our minutes be a discussion item, generally speaking. And I would like to know whether or not this board would be open to this. It's a procedural discussion, so it's not specific to the minutes, but um, I think it's something we should consider for the future. And I'd be willing to make, in addition to the motion of passing our minutes, the direction that in the future that these 
be put on our consent agenda. I don't know if that needs to be moved as part of this motion. And maybe Daniel, Mr. Bogarts, I could speak to whether or not that'd be appropriate to make as part of the motion or something that procedurally can just be done in the future. So Mr. Sosueta, perhaps you could speak to that um, if I need to make it as part of our motion um, or if it's just something that can be done. Um, I think that's appropriate now. I don't think we should, uh, I don't believe we need to make a motion at this point. Um, but I will say, however, that um, just remind me again, uh, Commissioner Violante, you were present at the last meeting. I'm just, I just don't see the minutes here in front of me. So I, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> so I was not, I did not participate in the last planning commission uh, because I was not advised that the um, uh, planning commissioner was not going to be present. So I was attended a majority of the meeting, but I had to step out uh, for uh, my primary occupation. So I was not present for the entirety of the meeting. I did go back and review the parts that I missed, but I was not present. So that was going to be my next question. Yeah, so why don't um, we do this? Why don't, Chair, why don't you um, ask if we can entertain a motion to to, to uh, defer these minutes until the next meeting um, because Commissioner Sheridan also was not in attendance, I believe. Um, so that would then, uh, if you deferred that until next meeting, we could also take up the issue of moving the minutes to the consent agenda in the future meeting. Well, um, Madam Chair, if I can speak, I, I think it's good to have them separate in the way that they are because usually the consent agenda is the consent agenda and anybody wants to pull it off to discuss something. Otherwise, it's fairly pro forma in the minutes. So usually, Com Commissioner, usually, Commissioner Shepard, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just wanted to make sure that we were clear that instead of discussing at this point, if we could just table this discussion until it's uh, noticed for next meeting. Is that okay, Commissioner Shepard? I'm sorry to cut you off there, but um, it, this is not something that was agendized, and so I don't think yes. it's appropriate that we discuss it at this time. But um, if we could move these minutes, sorry, not move these minutes, wrong term there, but to defer or continue these minutes till next meeting, then we could also agendize this conversation of um, whether or not we want to put it on the consent agenda in the future meetings. Is it, this is not an issue for a public hearing. No, but this is something yeah, that should have be on long, the agenda. If we're gonna have a long discussion about it, we might as well make it an agenda item. Um, so okay, let's- Okay, fine. I don't support it. And I can say why in exactly 30 seconds. Okay. And so for now, I'll make the motion that we defer the minutes, and then and later in the meeting, I'll make a recommendation that we agendize the discussion. So for now, let's I'll make the motion to defer these minutes. Well, I wouldn't support the motion. No, Mr. Commissioner Shepard, what I'm saying is that we do not have a quorum of people who were present at the last meeting in order to pass the current meeting minutes from the June 8th meeting, because Commissioner Sheridan and myself were not present at that meeting. So I'm saying we should not vote on the meetings from June 8th. That's what okay. I'm suggesting. Oh. So I'm suggesting we defer the June 8th minutes to the well, next that's, meeting. Um, that's, what, that's what my motion is. Oh, that's fine. Will we have will will we have a quorum at the next meeting? I believe we have. Um, so we we have a motion on the table, and it needs a second before we discuss. So it's just a motion to continue the minutes to the next meeting. I will second it. I believe I can second the motions. Okay, now we can discuss it. And I'm not sure. So and Mr. Zazueta, I we had this discussion years ago about whether people who were not at a meeting could vote on the minutes. And my recollection, this was when Chris Chelladon was our attorney, that he looked into this and actually people could vote on the minutes. So if you could just review that, because we have had this issue before where we've had minutes that are deferred for months in order to get a quorum of people who are actually present. And I'm not sure that that's actually really required, but if you could look into that for us for this item, for when this meeting, this uh, issue comes up at our next meeting, that would be great. I'm so happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add, I remember what Rachel remembers. That would be one of my reasons. Okay, so um, motion on the table to continue the minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That's I'm, abs I'm abstaining. I don't, I'm not sure where I'm at on this. So you can abstain. That's great. So motion passes with three eyes and one abstention. Okay. Let's move on now to 
our first scheduled or second scheduled item, which is item eight. Item eight. Good morning. Um, can we start by promoting Sheila McDaniel to panelist, please? Oh, silly guys. Sheila, can you please raise your hand and I can unmute you? I'm not seeing, seeing Sheila. Is anyone? Oh, there she is. Good morning, Sheila. Good morning. I hope you can all hear me. We can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so this is Sheila McDaniel, the project planner with the planning department. Working for prior staff, Liz Crambler, on this project, who is no longer with the department. Um, just as an FYI, I you know, read the staff reports and listened to the public testimony and read correspondence. And I'll have more to say to the public regarding public correspondence later in the presentation, but um, if you could uh, forward the slide, Mike, please. Thank you. So the original project came in in 2017. It was an 85 foot tower. Um, it was revised at the direction of staff and reduced in size to a 65 foot uh, tall mono eucalyptus wireless com uh, communications facility. It was scheduled before the zoning administrator on November 16th, 2018. And the zoning administrator um, denied the project because a mock-up was not provided per the wireless regulations. Um, in addition, the Pilots Association expressed concerns regarding airport safety. Following that decision, the applicant, um, Verizon, appealed the project denial, challenging the finding for denial because they weren't given specific requests to provide the mock-up as required by the ordinance. And they requested that the, um, the applicant, the response was to toll the shot clock to, to address that issue. So, and then since 2018, the um, Verizon obtained a no hazard to air navigation clearance from FAA at 65 feet in height. One second. With no required lighting. Um, in addition, um, in February of 2020, um, the county general plan and county code amended, uh, were amended to incorporate the airport safety requirements and they were effective in February of 2020, um, addressing the concerns by the Pilots Association that the uh, safety handbook standards be included in our general plan. So then subsequent, uh, prior to the next meeting, the applicant provided the 65 foot tall mock-up um, placed on the site two, re two weeks prior to the hearing as required. And then the planning commission considered the item on July 8, 2020. And at that meeting, the planning commission continued the project at the request of the applicant to, so the applicant could, could confer with the Watsonville Airport regarding airport safety um, issues regarding, you know, air, um, air obstruction versus um, airport navigation compliance. And the planning commission requested staff to provide findings for denial be due to aesthetic concerns regarding the mono um, eucalyptus, as well as staff to address height allowances of the code. And then uh, otherwise height increases allowed under the Spectrum Act um, and otherwise safety standards. So prior to the continued hearing date of uh, July 22nd, um, the applicant revised the project to a 47 foot water tank from 65 feet, reducing that height by um, 13 feet in height, or 18, I'm sorry, 18 feet in height. And then on July 22nd, the PC continued the hearing again to evaluate airport obstruction standards. Um, as well as um, for staff of, to evaluate the 47 foot water tank because that material was provided in very late in the application process and didn't allow the public or the planning commission to fully evaluate the project. And then the planning commission also requested re-noticing to include the public email list provided to the planning commission. Next slide, please.
The site lies approximately one half mile slightly north, but mostly west of the Wassonville Municipal Airport. The project site is located at 682 Buena Vista Drive, approximately 640 feet northwest of Buena Vista Drive down a one lane road on a 2.8 acre parcel located in the Agricultural Zone District, a designation that allows wireless communication facilities. Next slide, please. And there's an aerial of the project site on the left. As you can see, there's an existing single family dwelling on the site, approximately 220 feet north of the proposed enclosure. The property is zoned agriculture with airport influence combining zone district. As I previously noted, wireless communication facilities are an allowed use in the, this zone district. Next slide, please. This is the general plan scenic resource mapping overlay provided in the GIS illustrating that the project location is beyond protected highway one visual resource area and that is otherwise not for located on a map scenic roadway protected by the general plan. Next slide, please. Project plan, all proposed equipment and the 47 foot tall water tank will be located within a 784 square foot, eight foot high fence enclosure in the southeast corner of the parcel. The equipment area will contain a radio cabinets and a diesel generator provide continued service during power outages and emergencies. Utilities serving the proposed facility will be trenched underground from a nearby utility pole. Next slide, please. This is the project elevation. It's proposed open lattice frame and contains a water tank structure that will be approximately 13 feet by 12 feet in diameter with vertical faux wood slats painted portobello brown and darker horizontal banding. The tank structure will be capped by a slightly inclined turret roof with a single omnidirectional steady burning red safety light on top. That detail is on the right of your slide. I'm sorry that it's not really legible. I guess something happened when I cut and pasted that, but the that detail <laughs> indicates that the light diameter is 5.65 inches in diameter and a height of 7.75 inches with an under three watt low intensity light meeting the FAA advisory circular um, for the lighting uh, safety standard. Next slide, please. So this slide just illustrates that um, your planning commission considered previous to this hearing a 65 foot mono eucalyptus tree and now it's been revised as of the July 22nd hearing it's now a 47 foot water tank and has been evaluated by staff and as noted in the staff report. Next slide please. So there's visual simulations that are provided in your staff report. There's a variety of visual simulations and your commission should note that the applicant provided additional vi visual simulations, including night visual simulations that are attached at the last, the third item in the uh, visual simulation package attachment. And so as you can see, the visual sims show the structure and then you also see um, the night lighting and in, in the far right photo, you can see um, a circled area item that would be the view, view two looking toward the site. I've circled that. And then what you see in green is the applicant prepared a, um, a Google view shed perspective, view, a Google view shed of the, where the light might cast from the top of the tower. Next, please. And then this slide is taken from the Briarwood neighborhood, as you can see in the lower right hand, I mean the lower photo toward the facility, um, the existing and the proposed daytime location. You can see in the bottom photo of the existing and proposed where the proposed water tank will be located. Um, it's barely perceptible in this photo. And then on the right hand side, you'll see in the upper photo, the existing nighttime conditions with ambient lights, porch lights and such. And then below that is the proposed photo looking up above just to the right and center of the garage, you can see a tiny little red light. It's uh, barely perceptible relative to the other surrounding light. Next slide, please. 
this slide is taken at the, at the off ramp off of Highway 1 at the top of Trading on Buena Vista Drive, looking toward the facility. And again, the lower side slide on, says shows the proposed uh, faux water tank. You can see that, again, barely perceptible. And then the right hand shows the lo how it's going to appear relative to ambient lighting. And again, it's very difficult to pick out this red light in this ambient environment. Next slide, please. Um, I had a question. Could you go back and do you got a pointer or anything where you could show us where it is? Um, no, but I can. So what I, I did this it's purposefully. Right here. Quite honestly, I did this purposely because I felt like if it wasn't obvious in the nighttime photo, showing it out to you would make it even more clear. So there the light is. But by the fact that you're not seeing it, to me, makes it clear that it's not, it's very barely perceptible relative to the other light, the white and yellow light in the ambient area. Okay, Next, thanks. Please. So this slide is taken from the old Adobe Road, which is located to, I believe, to the west of the property, below grade of the subject property. So if you're looking at the existing slide, you can see the mock-up that the applicant placed. That mock-up has been there for, gosh, two years now for a 65-foot 60, uh, tall um, facility. And then below that is the proposed water tank that you can see more clearly from Adobe Road. This is probably the most the view that will have um, the most views of the facility. And then to the right, again, is the existing view at the upper image and then the lower view you can see the red light on the tank from the old adobe road area next slide please and then this slide slide is taken from buena vista which would be about um east of the property and this site is not visible from buena vista drive at this location next slide please So the code basis for approval here is that wireless communication facilities are allowed use in the agricultural zone district. And typically water tanks would be a building permit, otherwise um, ministerial approval because it's a wireless com communication facility it's subject to a level five approval. And the applicant has substantiated that there's a significant gap in coverage as shown in the, um, you'll see that in a minute. Um, in the allowed zone districts, it's not subject to an alternative analysis. So there is no requirement that the applicant provide an alternative analysis evaluating all the sites that could potentially provide coverage. And then the Facility meets both height allowances pursuant to 1310-510-D, two exceptions to HUD, in that it meets the 25-foot height exception allowance for water tanks, and it may also be determined to be exempt from height standards altogether pursuant to the height exemption for utilities, commercial power poles, and towers. And insofar as addressing the airport safety compliance issues that have been highlighted at all the meetings, um, the zoning administrator and the the last two planning commission meetings. The project meets both the FAA clearance at 47 feet and the FAA is not requiring a light. However, if a light is provided, they are advising that it meet the airport advisory for light standards. And the project also meets the Air Watsonville airport safety concerns at 47 feet or 241 feet above uh, mean sea level and includes a red light as requested by the airport. And again, I just want your commission to be very clear. It's a request by the airport and it's not required by the FAA, which is the ultimate authority providing clearance for um, the determination regarding no hazard to air navigation or no obstruction to air navigation. So it is included as in to respect the request by the airport. The project also meets RF compliance standards. The applicant has provided yet another updated RF report, again, showing compliance with the FCC um, RF emissions thresholds. 
And then finally, the project design is the least visually intrusive design feasible as a water tank consistent with the rural agricultural character of the area, minimizing visual impacts. And then I would, and then this is, of course, this is subjective depending on where you are relative to this project. Um, as staff, I would say the light is, red light is consistent with the existing night lighting in the area and barely perceptible. Next slide, please. Again, the code basis for project approval, the applicant has provided their gap in coverage information. You'll notice on the left-hand side, the existing 700 megahertz coverage map shows areas that are yellow and red, which are provide only good in-vehicle and good on-street coverage. The green on the far right shows with the facility, um, there will be good in-vehicle, good on-street, and good in-building coverage provided by the facility and demonstrated there is a significant gap. You'll also note that the applicant is provide, providing 4G service, not 5G service. That is an issue that the public has regarding this. I'll speak to this more, but the, the applicant is proposing 4G LTE, not 5G service. Next, please. And then again, the project minimizes visual impacts by camouflaging the wireless project as a water tank resulting in the least visually intrusive design feasible consistent with the rural agricultural character of the area. And then again, I wanted to note that water tanks and agricultural structure are normally in a principal permitted use within the district subject to a building permit only. Next, please. And with regard to conditions of the approval, staff is recommending that, that the plans include a red light atop the tank for the Watsonville Airport request. It's conditioned accordingly. The project is conditioned to include a red light. And as you have noted, the Planning Commission may strike this condition if desired as the red light is not required by FAA if it's objectionable to the public. And the project is also conditioned to provide additional landscaping to screen for the screen the facility on the um, eastern side relative to Seth Barron's property. And the project is also conditioned to require a final approval letter by the FAA should the FAA determination lapse before permit issuance. And then to speak to the Watsonville Airport concerns regarding the Spectrum Max, what would ordinarily be an allowance for a 20 foot height increase or 10%, whichever is greater, the project is conditioned to prohibit increases in heights allowed by the Spectrum Act due to the max height of 47 feet allowed by the FAA. And then responses to neighborhood input. I wanted to take some time to go through to talk about a lot of the public input. Since I picked up from staff before, um, I read the public correspondence and Starting with the mock-up, there was someone who noted that they felt that the mock-up with the mast wasn't sufficient to um, emulate what the project would appear to be. And I just wanted to tell this person that um, the mock-up is required based on the code and this code specifically notes that under 1310-660-D, for proposed new telecommunication towers, the applicant may be required to raise a temporary mast at the maximum height at the location of the proposed tower. So the, the applicant has raised a mast to the standard and that's the extent of, of any mock-up that's required. Um, you know, the project would have to be approved in order to allow a structure to be built to look like the water tank on the site. So our ordinance tries to allow someone to see what what the, the structure, where the structure will be located, how tall it will be. And with visual simulations, that's enough for us to evaluate. And there's a number of neighbors, I believe, that provided drone photos of the site, um, showing that they believe there's slope failure. And I wanted to note that's on the back side of the subject property. I wanted to note that the site is not mapped for landslides or geologic faults and that our environmental planning staff noted shallow slope failure resulting from uncontrolled drainage resulting in erosion along the hillside. This is not intended, this is intended to be addressed prior to issuance of a building permit and is not a site safety issue associated with the project. And with regard to comments regarding code compliance complaint, 
that they have, a number of folks have noted red tags or violations of the county code with regard to um, equipment, vehicles, and structures on the property. I would like to just lay out what the county's process with, is with regard to code compliance. The planning department is a code complaint driven department. And until a service request is filed to code compliance, no actions are taken by the department. However, to preemptively address this potential public issue, um, I've conditioned the project to require that any actual violations be addressed prior to building permit issuance, but that to note that until a service request is filed by the public, no such requirement will be applied to the project. However, I did contact code compliance, have um, an email from them. They reviewed the aerials of the property and he said, um, Aaron Landry, Aaron Landry, principal planner for code compliance indicated that if a code compliant complaint came in for a neglected property, vehicles, personal debris, property debris, et cetera, he doesn't think there would be an, anything to enforce. One, it's zoned agriculture and neglected property ordinance doesn't apply. And then everything appeared to be screened from public view and that equipment on the property appeared to be ag related. And as for the legality of the structures, there's simply, there's an electric permit and the structures appear to be constructed in 1963. So there is a condition should a, a complaint be lodged and it's verified violation, they will be required to be addressed prior to issuance of building permit. Another public member made a comment that the ownership of the property, the applicant wasn't authorized to make an application with the current trustee ish signature for the application. And I just wanted to tell you, I independently verified that the property ownership is noted as noted by Verizon has um, as stated in the appeal response letter is recorded in title documents with the trustee authorized to make the application on behalf of the trust since the death of the primary trustee is noted by the assessor and staff is satisfied that the applicant is authorized to make the application. Also, I would like to note that the public noted that the public correspondence was not included and I'm absolutely agree with the staff, with the public on this. All of the public correspondence from the zoning administrator in both public hearings, as well as the current correspondence is now in your packet for consideration. And I apologize, I, that's not something we, <laughs> we try to do. We, we try to include all the public correspondence if at all possible. And we've had a lot of correspondence regarding concerns regarding 5G radio interference um, with altimeters. And I just wanted to note that the applicant is proposing 4G, which is in the 700 megahertz range. And if, if I'm you know, not real an expert on this by any means, but I did Google this and confirmed that 5G is in the gigahertz range of 3.7 to 3 or 5, 3.98 or 5 gigahertz. And that 5G has limited line of sight and requires towers on every block for deployment. This is a high, a large tower within the 700 megahertz range is not proposed as a 5G facility. So I hope this puts this to rest. And then further is this corroborated by the RF report indicating that it's a 700 megahertz range um, for 4G. And then the, some public members have mentioned that um, they would like to see if the applicant could co-locate on the power pole. I'm going to allow the applicant to speak to this. They did include that in a response letter that's provided to your commission. And then lastly, I believe Becky Steinbrunner mentioned um, that the parcel is mapped with archeological resources. And I wanted to note that environmental planning staff um, visited the property, determined that an archeological site recon reconnaissance report is not required because the existing land use livestock paddock and the small project footprint proposed doesn't dem demand it. And, and mapping um, existing um, reports have been evaluated. However, the project is conditioned to require if resources are identified, that project will comply with the ordinance standard. This is a standard requirement. And then last slide, please. So I, this is not, we don't get an opportunity very often to circle back to your commission and show you 
you know, after years of public testimony and process and contentious appeals, um, what a project ends up looking like. And unfortunately, this one is just, I really think it came out fabulous. This is in the La Selva Beach um, area. It's 48 foot tall uh, wireless facility. And it really just looked amazing. I mean, it matches the green siding and the grass and fits in nicely on the site. And unfortunately, um, I was not able to circle back with the Seventh-day Adventist uh, wireless facility that's under construction now, but I will do so at some future hearing. Um, I want to just require, um, to inform your commission that the county is limited in regulating the aesthetics of wireless facilities, the equipment that's camouflaged, painted a certain color, or limited in size and siding, location preferences under grounded infrastructure and minimizing spacing between facilities of the new uh, communication facilities. So um, provided the facility meets RF standards and the ordinance requirements, aesthetics is the only thing your commission can really address. And then further, the county regulations do not require that wireless facility be invisible from the vantage point of surrounding properties, just that if visible from the public view shed that the facility is camouflaged to the extent feasible. As proposed at 47 feet in height and as designed to be camouflaged as a faux water tank, the project minimizes visual impacts to the public. And furthermore, I contacted our environmental coordinator regarding the CEQA exemption with regard to concerns regarding the light and and the environmental coordinator noted that there's case law supporting the use of the class three exemption included in your packet for this type of development based on two case laws um, that are cited. Um, don't sell art parks versus city of San Diego and Aptos Residents Association versus the County of Santa Cruz. Both the Aptos and the San Diego case confirm that the exceptions to the exemptions do not apply in similar cases. The environmental coordinator has reviewed the visual simulations and has determined that visual impacts associated with the light would not be considered significant if the project were not exempt under 15303 and notes that the light is an airport safety requirement. Staff is recommending you concur with this determination and the find the project exempt under class 15303. However, I do want to note your, it's your prerogative as the commission to prohibit the light as it's not required by the FAA. Staff is recommending that you com your commission conduct a public hearing to consider the project appeal and that you determine the pro proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act attached as exhibit 3A and that you approve application 171213 based on the project plans, attach revised findings and revised conditions of approval. And that concludes my presentation unless you have questions, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, thank you, Sheila, for that presentation. Are there any questions of commissioners for staff at this point? No. Okay, uh, Commissioner Sheridan. Hi, thank you, um, Sheila, for such a great report. Um, and I know some of you have already heard this. Uh, one of the things that I noted that I hadn't seen in the earlier plans was the relationship of this project to the property line. It looked like it was right on the property line of the neighbor, very close to it. Is that true? No, it meets the required setback if there's a 20 foot setback for all um, properties, all property setback at lines, front, side and rear. Mm -hmm. And did that property owner have a concern about the relationship of this uh, project to the property line? The, uh, the property owner that authorized the application? The, the neighbor, did they ever have, have do they have a house or a, or a building close to the property line that? It, there, it's my understanding there is a neighbor, him, he's probably in this meeting, Seth Barron lives immediately to the east of the subject property and I don't wanna presuppose his comments. So okay. his, Just curious. his house is, I believe, I believe that, the public correspondent said, I don't know, was it 600 feet and let him, I'm gonna allow him to speak to that okay. issue, but his okay. house is a distance from the property line to the east. Okay, thank you. And then um, uh, you and I had spoke earlier about the light, uh, the type of lighting, and I'm curious 
you said that this could be a um, optional vote for the planning commission and um, I'm just curious how uh, I, I really appreciate from the neighbor standpoint how an adding another light a red light might impact them and it seems like it's something that would be important for the neighbors to decide on some of them might be concerned about planes and whether a plane could be um, affecting you know a, a crash related event versus uh, having light uh, a new light in the neighborhood so it just seems like it's something that the neighbors that we would want to weigh in related to the neighbors that's those are my two comments at this point do any other commissioners have questions for scott um could you just go over again the issue of the light why is it's optional what are the benefits and what are the downsides i don't quite understand well, the applicant is required to obtain FAA clearance for the facility, and they provided initially an FAA clearance um, a determination of no hazard to air navigation, and then Watsonville Airport remained concerned regarding obstruction standards. And so once the general plan and code were amended to include the um, safety requirements, the Watsonville Airport still maintained requ request for a light. It's not required by the FAA clearance, however, so it's um, a preference of the airport as obviously it's their preference. Um, I would note that the any other structure at 47 feet would not be required to include a light. So if the a water tank actually, if the applicant had independently had proposed a water tank, it would have obtained a building permit would have been approved without a water or without a light um, so I, i'm not sure if i'm really answering your question but um, it's in correspond the current package provided to your commission there's an attachment from from the watsonville airport requesting the red light and the applicant has provided that red light and staff's in agreement that you know we should provide safety requirements if they have a request for it and i understand there's some tension between um, you know, the neighbors not wanting a red light and, and we'll list, I, I'm kind of just inclined to let it play out how it does. And your commission has that option to remove it. It's not the ultimate authority on this is the FAA. So if someone was putting up an, a water tank there, it would be legal to request one and it would be this high, correct? Yes, the ordinance allows for agricultural structures like water tanks to be at this height exactly. Okay, I'm sure we'll hear some testimony on this. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from commissioners to staff? Okay, um, so at this point, we can open the public hearing. Luzanne, how many folks are here for this item? Um, right now, I'm seeing four hands raised. Um, okay. five, hand, five hands raised. <laughs> Okay. Including Seth, who is the I believe the neighbor based on Sheila's um, okay. presentation. So um, everyone who wants to speak will get an opportunity. Everyone will have two minutes to speak. Uh, just to let folks know, we have all received um, voluminous um, public comment um, for this item and, and others that we've all read through. Um, and then I will also ask after public comment has concluded if it's necessary our council to be prepared to um, summarize for the commission uh, where our guardrails are in approving wireless communication facilities. It might be helpful to give the commission just a two minute brief refresher on, on that issue um, just to, to help some of our uh, newer commissioners. Okay, so with that, we can open up uh, the public hearing and hear from our first uh, members of the community. Well, I'll just start by reminding everybody, and although I do see some hands raised already, that to raise your hand, you select the hand icon on the Zoom link, or you can press star nine on the telephone. Um, but with that, we'll start with uh, David Witowski. Uh, good morning, David. Please state your name for the record. Good morning, my name is David Witkowski. Um, I'm a resident of Aptos, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you folks this morning. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you, David. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to uh, note regarding the question about gap in coverage. Um, we do a lot of work with local governments at the city, county, state, federal level. One of the things that we are working on uh, right now is a lot of digital inclusion uh, and specifically looking at the question of underserved or unserved areas. Uh, this area that is in question per Purdue University's digital divide index uh, is scored at 27 out of 100, meaning that it is uh, extremely, is considered extremely underserved. Uh, and this is also related to infrastructure and adoption and socioeconomic index of the area, which, which all contribute to the DDI score. So I, can, I would like to urge the commission to support this project based upon the fact that this area has a significant gap in coverage, not only as attested to by the applicant, but also as attested to by Purdue University, uh, FCC filings under Form 77, uh, a, a variety of other means all point to the fact that there is a significant issue in this area. And um, I appreciate the time and I'm gonna yield back uh, the balance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, next caller I will call on is uh, phone number nine four eight three please press star six to unmute yourself we have caller nine four eight three calling on the phone please hi there mary lee sands wiley i live over on craving i was looking at an aerial of that roadway uh, you mentioned that it's a one lane road there's three homes on it even theft uh, originally was off Buena Vista, but with the housing in the back, there's at least a total of three, possibly more um, units back there of people living in them. And but but the uh, I've noticed from here that every time the people come in to work on the home on Upper Craving on the north end, they leave large equipment pieces there. Uh, a couple times we've had to call the high risk toll to get them to move. I was calling the company that the equipment was rented from and said, please don't park on this side of the road because it uh, creates a lethal hazard for me trying to come out from my road to get onto craving. And, and they have improved it. We do have a cul-de-sac, but with your one lane there, it's gonna create a problem for the other people plus increased dust when they have to come in and do maintenance and what steps are in place to prevent Verizon from converting it from a 4G to a 5G because I wouldn't know the difference and such as to what equipment they're putting on there or adding height to it in the future because it is rather off the beaten path to um, keep an eye on what they're doing. Just my, my concerns, I believe they can place that tower someplace else and have better coverage for everybody, but um, that's my concerns. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, let's see, who do we have? Suzanne, could I uh, interrupt for just a second? This is support staff, Michael Lamb. Um, I just got an email from the applicant, Trisha Knight, uh, requesting that she be able to give their presentation before public comment. Yes. Uh, Rachel, are you in support of that? Um, yes, absolutely. I um, apologize that we didn't go to the applicant first. Um, that's usually our custom is to let the applicant make their presentation and speak to the commission first. So, um, Tricia, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, we'll hear your testimony for the record. And how long we usually uh, limit the applicant um, to five minutes, if that works for them. We had quite a lengthy staff presentation, so I think that should be sufficient. Good morning, Tricia. Can you please unmute by, uh, we should get an up. She may also be calling in. She gave me a phone number ending in 1778. I do see that in the attendee 
I do West. see that in attendee. I don't see a hand raised. Tricia, do we have you here today? Maybe Mike, you could um, text her or call her back. Let her know she's un she just needs to unmute. Yeah, why don't we go to another member of the public while we're waiting to queue up Tricia so that we don't lose too much time. Uh, let's move to Seth. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, can good you hear morning. Me? Good morning, Tricia. Yes, we can hear you. Good morning. I'm so sorry. I had a technical difficulty. Glad everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, thank you for allowing us the time. Yes, five minutes is uh, sufficient. Just a, a presentation um, that we've um, set up for you. If I can share my screen. Can we allow Tricia to share her screen, please? Here we go. All right, we can see that, Tricia. does appear that Trisha has muted herself maybe inadvertently. So Trisha, if you can hear us, go ahead and unmute yourself. You are sharing your screen. There we go. Can everybody hear me? We can yes. hear you. Okay. <laughs> unmute, unmute, unmute. Um, good morning. Uh, this is Trisha Knight representing Verizon Wireless for um, our project that we have titled Old Adobe Road. Um, I work with Day 5 Infrastructure Partners as a consultant for the perm uh, per permit processing. And I also have my project manager, Tim Adams. Um, and as I go down the line, if you wouldn't mind um, making sure that they're all uh, visible so that when they do raise their hand, they'll be speaking to different aspects of the project. So um, if you can see, if you can see them as I go through, that would be very helpful. Um, I, and next I have uh, Dwayne Bonham, who's our radio frequency design engineer for Verizon. And he can, there he is. There we go. Okay. Getting some feedback from Seth. Uh, Seth, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, that would be fantastic. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. I'm on phone and the computer, so. There, there we go. Can everybody still hear me? We can hear you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and we also have uh, Don, Car Don Carmichael with Previgilus, who um, created the photo sims that are associated, the nighttime photo sims that are associated with the project that Ms., uh, that Sheila touched on. Um, so if you have questions about um, the light and those photo sims that are in part of your packet, he's available to speak to those. And lastly, we have Paul Albritton from McKinsey and Albritton, who is Verizon Legal Counsel, who will be speaking to uh, various aspects of the project as well. And going on to the next slide, just giving a brief overview of uh, how long this project um, has been moving along here. So in October of 2014 is when we identified that gap in coverage that um, Sheila referred to. And then we had a long period of time from January to May where we investigated different locations, all of the aspects of the project that have to line up um, a lease and that it is in an allowed zone for uh, permitting and it's constructible and also definitely meets the needs of the, of the network. We selected the site in uh, May of 2017 and it started with an 85 foot um, faux tree, eucalyptus tree. And in working with FAA and also with the planning department pre-application submittal process, um, brought that height down to 65 feet. Um, and then we submitted our application and then went before the zoning administrator because as Sheila had mentioned, it's in an allowed zone um, and meets all the height requirements. Um, and so we went to the ZA and unfortunately were denied. 
uh, due to the fact that there was no mock-up placed on the property. Um, immediately following that, we appealed, uh, uh, erected the mock-up on the property, and then at that time, the county was updating its general plan to incorporate state airport regulations um, per the request of the Pilots Association. So we were working with Watsonville Airport, the FAA, and the Pilots Association. Um, and then in July of 2020, um, we had the planning commission hearings and it was continued to allow Verizon uh, more time and to get provide more information and also place the mock-up. The Verizon wireless uh, facility before you today is that 47 high foot water tank um, that came down to that height to uh, take in all considerations for airport safety standards and uh, making note that the stationary voluntary red light was requested by airport management, but as Sheila stated, uh, is not required, um, but is part of our current proposal. Moving on to the next slide is to go over that service gap. So we currently already have a Verizon facility here at the airport. It's not, um, it's not close to the runway, but it is at the airport. And then um, to the left of the screen, you'll see the other existing facility. There's gaps in in-building coverage northwest of Watsonville, as well as along the roadways, including Larkin Valley Road. And you can see in the middle of the screen here, the old, the, the project before you, and you can see the lack of continuity between the airport facility and this is known as our uh, Marmonte. Um, and so there's gaps in in-building and in vehicle coverage. Moving on, if you choose to approve this project and once constructed, you can see that really does fill in the gaps. And also to make note, um, in the next slide, we'll go over the demand and capacity issues that are also in this area. Moving on to the next slide here. Um, so increasing demand, we're all using our devices as we sit here on this call today. And so uh, you, you've got actual projected use and exhaustion thresh thresholds, which has already been um, exceeded two years ago. And it's taken quite some time to get to where we are um, in the permit process. And so uh, Dwayne Bonham, our, our uh, frequ RF frequency engineer, can speak to this a little bit more if you have questions as we move along. Alternatives, so um, one of the unique things, as you know, are about the ordinance when it comes to uh, telecommunications facilities is there are areas that are prohibited um, and areas that are um, encouraged. Uh, we are currently in that agriculture zone, which is um, not prohibited, but we are surrounded by um, some commercial, agricultural, and special use zones, which are. And then to the south here, you can see we looked at some properties um, where we're not able to entertain a lease. And then we've trying to stay a little bit further away from these residential neighborhoods over here. And so that is another reason why we um, didn't get on the property that we currently are. Uh, here is the design of that water tank. It is rural in nature um, in the location that it's in. Um, it's half of the height that's allowed in that agricultural zone. We'll be painting it brown. You saw the as-built green tank that um, Sheila had showed you. They really do blend nice into these areas. You can see from a distance that we've got some trees that are surrounding the area. And so that does add as a nice backdrop to a certain viewpoint. Um, and the red light as requested by the airport poses a minimal impact at night as there is existing lighting features over on that hillside. So in uh, airport safety compliance. So Watsonville Airport supports the 40 to 47 foot facility which avoids penetrating initial climb area of east-west runway and requests the red safety light. And that was in January of 2022. Um, we wanted to point out that it does not exceed obstruction standards and would not be a hazard to air navigation per the FAA letter in your packet from May of 2021. And that the Pilots Association does not oppose the project at the proposed height, um, but it cannot have any height increases, cannot be uh, approved without going through all the proper channels. And that concludes my presentation for now. And I am, I don't know how many minutes I am, but um, any leftover time I would like to reserve for rebuttal um, after public comment or if you, um, the commission has any um, additional questions at the end. And I'm here to answer any questions right now that you may have. Um, yes, Trisha, yes, you can reserve the rest of your time um, at the to address any comments at the conclusion of the public hearing before it comes back to the commission. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. okay. So now we can go back to the public. 
Um, okay, so the, the first number I see, uh, 9483, was that Tricia? Or was that, so um, I see a caller calling in by telephone. The last four digits are 9483. Um, please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Hi there, 9483 is me for Mary Lou and I spoke already. Okay, thank you, Mary. Could you please um, lower your hand? I, I think star six. We'll go back to the list, please. Can we go back to the, I uh, take down the timer and go back to the list so I can see everybody, please. Okay, uh, the next is uh, a caller, uh, is at last four digits, a 2915. Uh, caller 2915, can you please uh, unmute yourself by pressing star six and state your name for the record. Hello, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Becky. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning again. Um, I, I want to point out that this is going to add a significant fire risk to the Larkin Valley area. And it being on a ridge top, it is especially concerning that there would now be a fuel tank there next to uh, what I assume would be a wooden covered uh, spa water tank structure. At the very least, this commission needs to require the applicant to add in at least 15,000 gallons water storage tank for fire suppression next to the facility with a dedicated hydrant next to the driveway. It is incredibly important, especially given the wildfire situation in the state, that there be sufficient water right at the site and reduce the risk of adding a fuel tank on a ridge top. I also want to ask that uh, it be stated very clearly that 5G will never be allowed at this site. It is common knowledge in the telecom industry that 4G has a limited life, perhaps 10 years, perhaps shorter. I think even though the applicant is saying, no, it will only be 4G, I think that the language in the conditions of approval need to be clear it will never be allowed to have 5G because of the safety problems known to airport navigation. I see no geotechnical studies to support that this is a stable area. Um, and also there are no additional studies of the wind resistance of this new water tank design on a ridge top. That needs to be done to ensure that it will be safe and stable. I see uh, little information about the impacts of the, the diesel generator on the air quality of those who live nearby or the noise. Those of us that live in the mountains know that noise uh, travels very yeah. far. I'm sorry, Becky, but uh, your two minutes has uh, ended. Thank you for All your, right. the last your comments. Comment is please Okay, um, I'd like to call on Seth. Uh, Seth, please unmute yourself. Uh, that should be a pop-up coming up on your screen. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Seth. Can we okay, please? hi, yeah, thank, thank you all for taking the time again on this. Uh, I am uh, devastated by this, uh, what looks like is going to go through project. It is going to have a huge negative impact on me and the surrounding area. And the photos that were taken were selectively taken from dis a distance on a wide angle uh, view shed. Um, if you come down Larkin Valley Road or you come down Buena Vista, you will see this as a long middle finger standing on the ridge, very obvious and an obvious visual impact that is a deniable factor in your own code where you rewrote it for cell towers uh, last year, um, not just doing the best you can to camouflage it, but you have the right, as I understand, to deny this based on that. Um, and also I'd like to see 5G never allowed there. Um, another thing in the staff report, I noticed uh, that a geotechnical review, um, one or two phases was required prior to uh, conditioning. Um, 
And this tower is serving a very small area, a one mile section of roadway. Will the panel please weigh the, the detriment to the area versus the minimal benefit of a small, relatively small linear gap filled that quite frankly, all the people there really don't have a problem with. I've talked to all of them and they say, no, we, we're good. Um, I talked to many people. And so I think that this is a, a land grab on a cheap lease and a refusal to look at options just because they don't have to, where they'd have to pay more to place them on the power poles and a variance for, for zoning could easily be issued. You guys have done it before. This is the applicant wanting to just get by by not having to pay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Seth. Yep. Um, is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this item at this time? If so, please raise your hand by pressing the star icon on, in Zoom, or if you are using your phone to call in, by pressing star nine. I'm not seeing any further hands raised at this time. Uh, Michael, are you seeing anybody? I'm not seeing any additional hands, Roseanne. Okay. In that case, I'll turn back over to you, start, uh, Chair Dan. Okay, well, I would invite the applicant to uh, use any additional time to um, make any final comments. Oh, I do actually see one additional oh. hand just raised. Um, this is Paul Albritton. Um, this is actually from the applicant team, so. Oh, okay. So this this is part of their rebuttal time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can uh, you hear Paul, me? We Paul can Albritton. hear you. Yeah. No, I I was going to take the rebuttal, so I don't need the. This is Paul Albritton for the applicant, and I'll speak on rebuttal. Do you want me to do that now? Yes, please, Paul. Okay. Uh, Paul Albritton, outside counsel for Verizon Wireless. Thank you very much for hearing our application today. As you heard, we've been working on this for almost eight years. It's very important to Verizon Wireless's network. And the, one of the greatest importance is to offload that Watsonville Airport site, which has been overloaded for several years and can't serve the customers that are demanding the service. Uh, with respect to a couple of issues, there is no increased fire risk from the generator. These generators, uh, the fuel tank is a double uh, belly walled tank underneath the generator itself uh, in a containment area. And there is no risk to fire uh, from, the, from the generator. And this type of generator is all over the county and used uh, if the noise <coughs> as is limited by the, the uh, generator is only used during emergencies and can only be exercised uh, as once every two weeks uh, during uh, business hours as conditioned under the um, conditions of approval and also is uh, permitted under the air, air quality board. Uh, with respect to uh, geotechnical and Wind load; those are addressed in the building permit portion of the uh, of the application, and will be carefully reviewed. All of these facilities, of course, carefully designed to uh, survive excessive uh, wind load, as well as geotechnical uh, report. Um, I mentioned the, the gap in coverage. Uh, the power poles were looked at. Of course, the power poles are in, in able, unable to hold the equipment that Verizon Wireless needs to place uh, within this facility, and are, are therefore infeasible. I want to make one more comment regarding 5G. 5G is a technology. It's just like uh, improving your Windows uh, software or your Mac OS software. Uh, in, in the simple terms, what it does is allow the aggregation of, of bandwidth so that we can have multiple in, multiple out frequencies at the same time. It can be used on any, any, any frequency. Uh, it can be used on 700, 800, uh, AWS, PCS, uh, and so it, it uh, and there's no risk to air navigation from 5G. The risk is from C band, which is a new frequency that was recently licensed by ATT and Verizon Wireless in the 3.7 gigahertz and 3.9 gigahertz range, as Sheila uh, referenced. And ATT and Verizon have been working carefully with the FAA in terms of the rollout of C band. Uh, we would not be able to put that band on this facility near the airport without a further FAA uh, review. Uh, that review is going on, and it, all it uh, uh, essentially deals with is the uh, clearance of filters on the altimeters on older altimeters on older airplanes. And the FAA is working through those uh, aircraft in order to make sure those altimeters have the appropriate uh, filters. But I want to emphasize again, uh, 5G is a technology. It's just like upgrading the software on your computer. 
Uh, it can be used on any frequency and the and uh, 5G uh, will be provided from this facility, but not the C-band frequency, which is the C-band frequency and in the future, 5G. The C-band frequency is the, the frequency of concern to the FAA and Verizon Wireless and at and are working closely with the FAA to make sure that there's no risk to air navigation. I can expand on any of those issues. And I do wanna point out, we have a whole group of very talented people, including Dwayne Bonham, our RF engineer, uh, Don Carmichael, who did those nighttime photo simulations of the light. Uh, I wanna say that the airport management is the source of the request for the light. Uh, and, and to give you one thought, and that is that the, the light can be approved on the facility. Uh, and if it turns out to be an issue uh, that you wanna revisit in the future, the light can be turned off. Uh, and so it, it's something that um, can be included in the plans. And, and if there is an issue in the future, it could be uh, resolved. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. As I mentioned, we have a whole uh, group of uh, talented experts who can answer any questions you may have. And thank you for the time for the rebuttal. Thank, thank you, Paul. Mr. Albritton. Um, okay, so Lizanne, if there is nobody left with their hand raised, we can mm -hmm. close the public hearing. There are no, hand, no hands raised at this time. Thank Great. you. Let's close the public hearing. Thank you, everybody who spoke. Appreciate you being present and calling into the meeting. So we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for questions, discussion, and a possible motion to take action on this item. We can, okay, here I am. Commissioner, why don't you start us off? Um, I'm curious whether, I think it's Seth, your, the neighbor that spoke earlier, what, what his viewpoints are on the light, what, whether he was opposed to the light or want, wanted it, if he had a choice. I will defer to um, Chair Dan, but I would say, Ms. Sheridan, Commissioner Sheridan, that this is time for our discussion. Um, we've already heard public comment, and it, this is, I, I think it would be more appropriate to have a conversation among um, Commissioner Dan, Commissioner Shepard, yourself, and me to, to discuss okay. what our thoughts are on the light, and I'd be happy to share mine. Yeah. I'm sure Commissioner um, Shepard and Chair Dan, but uh, we, we've already had public comment, and so. Okay, that's, that's fair. And on the light, my understanding is this is a request from the airport. Right. So, um, and then, so before we begin, why don't I ask if council will just take maybe no more than two minutes to brief and refresh the commission on what uh, our guardrails are when we make determinations about wireless communication facilities. So, uh, sure, I would be happy to do that. This is Daniel Sesueta, Associate County Counsel. Uh, sorry, Assistant County Counsel. I'm just going to read from um, some notes that I have of some pre prepared uh, remarks. And um, I'm gonna quote extensively from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which is federal law. So under federal law, local governments have the authority to regulate the placement, construction, and modification of wireless communication facilities subject to certain limitations. So I just wanna rep uh, to repeat that. So under federal law, local governments are really restricted to only regulating the placement, construction, and modification. And uh, among the limitations, local government uh, regulations may not unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. They may not prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services. So what that means basically is uh, we can't sig uh, signal single out um, wireless communication facility providers and uh, discriminate against among them. So for example, if we're going to say, hey, you can you can put up a water tower here, but you can't put up a, a wired water tower um, if it has antennas in it just because you're a wireless communication provider. Um, so basically, if our code allows for this type of structure to go up, we have to allow it for everybody to put up this type of structure. Um, if it's if it's proper in this place and um, and we've we've gone through the kind of plan check with our county code. So any denial of an application to place, construct, or modify this facility has to be based on substantial evidence contained in the written record, which means that we need to have um, a lot of evidence to show that this is not the proper place 
um, to construct this particular wireless facility. So, um, and I have to note that any such denial cannot be based on environmental health uh, impacts of the wireless facility. And I think this is the most important distress because this seems to be missed over and over um, at, in public bodies throughout the state or throughout the country is that um, any local governments does not, local governments do not have the authority to base any denial on environmental or health impacts of wireless facilities. Specifically, federal law provides that a local government may not regulate the placement, construction, and modification of wireless facilities based on environmental effects of radio frequency emissions. Um, to the extent that uh, such facilities comply with uh, the FCC's regulations concerning such emissions. So we have, we have the authority to say, hey, you have to show us whether or not um, this particular wireless communication facility complies with radio frequency emissions as set out by FCC standards and the standards of federal law. And if they do comply, then um, there's nothing more we can really say about it. Um, the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission has regulatory jurisdiction over radio frequency emissions and uh, including the impacts of radio frequency radiation from cell phones and cell phone towers. Um, so. Just want to reiterate that the regulation of environmental health impacts from wireless communications facilities is a matter of federal jurisdiction. And the county has no regulatory authority in this area as a matter of federal law. So the county is really limited in regulating just the siting, aesthetics, operation, construction, and modification of wireless communications facilities in the unincorporated areas of Santa Cruz County. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, I know it's a, bit, a tad confusing, but um, really the federal government has kind of uh, taken the field when it comes to the environmental and health impacts of wireless facilities. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Um, are there any questions uh, for Daniel? Okay, so let's open it up to the commission and um, we'll be looking for a motion or discussion. Okay, well, I'll start. Um, <laughs> I will just say that um, I believe that this application meets all of the criteria in our code um, for approval. And as such, I would support a motion for approval. But I, as chair, I cannot make a motion. So I'll be looking to another commissioner to do that. May, may I make another comment prior to a motion? Thank you. Um, going back to the um, impact of the red light, uh, I understand that it is a request, but does not have to be decided upon the red light on top. And um, I do believe that's an important, um, if I really want to uh, acknowledge that if I lived in this country setting and I was a neighbor, I would be bothered by a red light in the area. And um, I think we have to do our best to keep lights uh, down for a lot of reasons, birds and nature, and we know that there's impact, but we also know that people are bothered by lights in their windows and looking out in a country setting. So um, I would uh, wonder if there was a way, and I think, um, I think the uh, planner, Sheila, had mentioned that there might be a way to return to that idea if the red light was something that was bothering the neighbors that they might be able to return to it. So I wonder if a motion might be able to, if there's an approval of this or a motion to approve going forward, if that light concept is still a negotiable um, or it could be revisited somehow. Commissioner Dan? Yes, yes, Commissioner Shepard. Um, I I would make a motion, maybe we can leave the light in and have it come back on the consent agenda in a requisite amount of time to see if there's been any complaints or issues with it. And then that if they turned off, if they're legitimate. That is one way to go about it. So I would move approval of the staff recommendation with that condition that the light, the red light um, be installed, but come back to us uh, Lizanne, what would be an appropriate amount of time? After construction of the tower? Um, should, should be at least one year, I think. Yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Uh, 
after a year to hear if there are any issues about it, since we have the option of suggesting it be turned off. So that would be my motion. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Mayor Shepard, can I make a friendly uh, recommended amendment to your motion? Sure. Absolutely. Can I, can I suggest it only come back to us if there's complaints, kind of like so that I don't yes. see any re reason for it to come back to us if there's not. I mean, I, I hear you. I, I actually think that people who live in this area know they live in an airport district. Um, and I would want okay. to err, err on the side of safety. So I agree with you. I believe the light should actually be kept in. And I only I don't see a reason to bring it back to the Planning Commission unless there are complaints. Well, I think that's a good suggestion. So I'm amending my motion to say approval of the staff recommendation and the and in one year, if there have been any complaints about it, would appear on our consent agenda. Is, Anne, is that manageable for you, the planning department? Yes. That, that sounds reasonable, yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess it might be nice. Oh, to I just have to make sure the second, the seconder of the motion has to approve that as well. So okay. Lisa, you second okay. the motion. Is that acceptable to you? That's acceptable to me. Great, so we have a, a amended motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Were there any abstentions there? Not that I heard. Okay. Okay, I think that we probably need to take a break as per CTV, right? And how long does that need to be for the CTV folks? I believe we need uh, at least 10 minutes. Is that correct? Michael, can you just confirm that, please? Um, <clears throat> I would defer to CTV staff. I know we are required a 10 minute break and then possibly a 30 minute lunch break, but I, I can't say for certain. So if Olivia, you're still on the call, please confirm what your required breaks are. I believe it's 10 minutes. Okay, why don't we take 10 minutes now and so that means we will come back at 1130. And then when we come back, we will we'll be on item nine. All right, that sounds great. Thank you, Dave, okay. Rachel. Thank you. Our planning commission meeting, June twenty second. <laughs> All right. Well, Wednesday, June twenty second. Our commission meeting is reconvening, and we are now on item nine. Let's welcome back everybody. So we're um, talking about. I would just going to promote um, Anais and Leticia. Okay, so I believe we're starting with studies uh, item 10 on the agenda, the study session to consider the sustainability policy and regulatory update. Is that correct? Um, and I think we, um, we item nine is the wastewater um, oh, so. treatment and sewage, very important topics of sewage and I, yes, you're, you're, you're right. I apologize. <laughs> Yes. We don't want to pass over um, mm -mm. all important issue of septic um, and other other things. So, but don't worry, Anais, we'll get to you. Okay. Um, I did see that Marilyn Underwood was, was here. Um, Marilyn, would you please unmute yourself? Uh, we promote you to panelist. Good morning. Good morning, Marilyn. Uh, we can hear you, Marilyn. I think you muted yourself again, though. I see you're muted. Okay, I think it launches unmuted, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> good morning. Um, and I also need John Ricker um, un or raised to a panelist as well, please. 
appreciate it. So there's John. All right. Thank you. And John, you will also need to unmute yourself. And then I get to share. Hold on, I should have been doing that. I think this is the right one. Are you seeing? Oh, not quite yet. I got to hit another button. Okay. Hopefully, you are seeing the screen. Yes, I see some nods. Excellent. So, yeah, so I can hear you're all excited about sewage. Uh, that's great. Um, it's, it is a really important topic because we do have something like 27,000 parcels in our county. Um, our, uh, their sewage is treated by an on site wastewater treatment system. And so, um, and our water quality is super important. So, that's where these two intersect. And we're here before with you with the both the general plan and county code 7.38, the sewage disposal amendments. These amendments are in part due to the fact that there's um, state law and state policy that require, required us to relook at our ordinance uh, and, and also general uh, plan as well for our on-site wastewater treatment systems. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of background um, and then get to the ordinance and the general plan changes. But I'm gonna to try to, as I speak with you today, get away from sep talking about septic systems just because um, they're not really, as we um, are seeing new systems being put out there on constrained sites, they're more and more having to use more fancy equipment than just a septic tank and leach field. And so they're really, the correct term is on-site wastewater treatment system. That's a lot to say. So it's been um, shortened to OTS. So I'm going to try to I'm trying to train myself not just today but um, to, you know every day to talk about OTS not septic systems. Then the other thing I'm going to be referring to is the local agency management program, also shortened to be LAMP. So if I use both of those terms, um, hopefully uh, you can interrupt me and I'll try to explain every now and then. But um, those are two terms I'll be using. And just lastly, we are the local agency as seen by the state and the regional board for implementing. Um, um, uh, ordinance uh, OTS oversight in our county. So I'm going to start off with some background uh, and get in, as I say, into the later into the ordinance and general plan changes. So the background is on this law was passed all the way back in 2000, uh, AB 885. It basically came about by the state because there's they were seeing imp impacts to drinking water in various locations um, from OTS um, placement. Um, and they felt that this locals that usually determine um, where land development could be placed um, were not um, having enough minimum standards to make sure that drinking water wasn't impacted. Uh, so they um, wanted, um, the state wanted some minimum standards developed. Well, it took a while, a lot of interaction. There were some missteps at first, but they finally passed the state OTS policy in, um, in 2012. Within that state policy, it required the oversight that we see from the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, which is out of San Luis Obispo County, to develop, redo their Central Coast Coastal Base Plan within five years, and they did it within five years uh, in 2017. And then also we, at the county level, if we wanted to maintain oversight of OTS in our county, we would have to produce a local agency management plan that addressed the minimum standards set up in the OTS policy, and we were supposed to have done that by May 2018. We did not do that by May 2018, but the good news is we did get it done last year, October 14th of 2021. Uh, the Central Coast Regional Board did adopt our local agency management program um, document that was also called the LAMP. Um, and Appendix A, which is our ordinance, sewage disposal ordinance, is um, Appendix A of that LAMP. Um, so in essence, they also were approving our LAMP. We had extensive um, community outreach and also outreach to our technical assistance uh, group, on-site wastewater group, prior to submitting this to the regional board. Um, and we continue to interact with that group as well uh, on the, this very technical document. When October 14th happened, we were to implement those parts of the LAMP that essentially were required in the state OTS policy. So we have been doing that. Uh, and I will talk later about um, some of the things that we will not be implementing until 
that are in the ordinance until the ordinance is adopted by both the Board of Supervisors and the Coastal Commission. So why are odds so important is, well, um, we do only get water for, uh, for drinking water in our county from pretty much within our county. What falls within our county is rainwater. Um, and we don't import from Hetch Hetchy or somewhere else. And yet we have, as I mentioned, 27,000 OTS um, on parcels out there. And so what we know is that if OTS are installed, planned, designed, sited, installed, operated, and maintained correctly, then they won't have an impact on water quality. However, if some issues of them being uh, too densely spaced, poorly designed, installed, operated, and maintained, then we, you can end up having issues. And these issues primarily we focus on our pathogens and nitrates, but I will also say that not the typical OTS system is not necessarily designed to get at those things like pharmaceuticals, um, some of the issues like, like steroidal hormones and some of your other things that you often hear about that even fancy um, sewer system uh, treatment plants don't address. So again, we focus on pathogens and nitrates because they are the big ticket item, but we, there are other items of concern in our um, septic systems as well. And the, the septic system here is displayed in this image by a cesspool. We don't really allow in the new regulations, we will not allow cesspools, uh, but just imagine it can be a seepage pit or a trench. These can, can uh, flow and you don't see this at the surface, but they can flow and their contaminants can be released to the groundwater, which can flow into um, and affect our streams and our oceans. Uh, also, you can have surface flooding that clearly can go run off and go into our streams and surface water. Um, and these contaminants can also uh, affect our wells. Uh, and, and obviously the parcel that where the, the, cess, uh, the seepage pit or trench is located on, but also your, the neighbors. And all of these things are things we are concerned about and um, the regulations and our ordinance uh, try to address by minimizing or not having any of those impacts. So this is just a photo, uh, I'm gonna image of again of the major water purveyors that we have in our county. Um, and they depend on both groundwater and surface water for their drinking water. And so that's why uh, both of those, protecting both of those um, uh, types of water bodies are important to us. Um, city of San Lorenzo Valley Water District has both, um, depending upon where you are, uses groundwater and surface water. City of Santa, Santa Cruz is mostly depending on surface water, both from the San Lorenzo, as well as some of the area along, along the coast, coast here, the creeks. Uh, coastal influence, Soquel Creek 100% groundwater, Central Water District 100% groundwater, uh, City of Watsonville in this area, primarily 90% uh, groundwater, but some surface water. And then we have a number of small water systems that are, that means less than 199 systems around this, the county that also can de depend on groundwater and surface water, as well as our groundwater individual water systems. Um, that depend on um, uh, us maintaining and protecting groundwater. So these are the major groundwater basins. Um, I think maybe hopefully you guys are familiar with this just because of a lot of the news around how we have to protect these groundwater basins now under state law, but we've been doing it for many years anyways. Um, there's been a lot of effort on protecting these, uh, both the Pajaro Valley overseen by a, uh, the Pajaro Valley Water District down there Mid County now has a sustainable groundwater agency, as well as the Santa Margarita and all coming under uh, the state system to make sure these overdraft water basins are protected for the future uh, for people that use them, not just in quantity, but also, which is the main emphasis of uh, sustainable groundwater programs, but certainly in quality as well of the water. These are the groundwater recharge areas, meaning the water that falls from the, the, the sky you know, during rainfall. Um, these are the areas that feed those different groundwater basins. And you do notice that they're slightly different, um, or not necessarily absolutely overlapped. Uh, but again, these are why we care about these groundwater recharge areas as well uh, when we think about the OTS placement. This shows you now I'm shifting to watershed. So we were talking about groundwater. Now we're talking about watersheds, the important different watersheds that uh, again are important to our drinking water systems. 
Uh, and you see the blue that is uh, the primary one, but also these um, lighter blue as well, very important watershed areas that we need to protect. And this I'm not going to switch into, well, we, we need to protect these. And partly we already see that there's been impacts. Um, these are, this is a very a somewhat dense slide, but I'm going to walk you through it. The, these are areas, water bodies, surface water bodies in the county that have already been identified as having uh, contamination in them of either pathogens, coliform, uh, sediment, or nitrates. Uh, such that we've had to start doing, uh, the regulations have required us to start looking at the sources of them and starting to look at how we can control those sources so we don't see those impacts. Um, the ones I wanted to draw your attention to, and these are called the total daily maximum daily load, have total maximum daily load have been PMDL, have been established for these water bodies. In particular, Pento Lake, we can see that on-site wastewater systems have been identified as the second major source for the phosphorus and cyanotoxins that are look, um, being found there. The number one, and definitely the, by a large majority, is agricultural manure and fertilizer, but nevertheless, uh, OTS being some impact. Then the other two is the San Lorenzo has identified, it has a PMDL for pathogens, again, on-site systems are the number one source for there. And the San Lorenzo Valley watershed for nitrates, again, the number one um, source. I will also say there has not been a TMDL nest yet developed in, uh, for Sausage Fuentes Creek, but the pathogens in the Sausage Fuentes Creek have also been identified as coming from primarily OTS. This is just a further illustration, and I know it's a little complicated, but I'm gonna lead you through it. That shows you just the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, San, Zo, San Lorenzo River. And we're looking at the bottom is the rainfall. You can see the rainfall patterns from 1980 to 2019. S similarly, you can imagine that the flow of the river correlates quite well with the, with the, the rain. And similarly do the amount of fecal coliform and also nitrates measured as nitrate, nitrogen in the river as well. Um, and the two sets of data you're seeing that we've looked to take, take samples at Big Sit Trees location and also the city of Santa Cruz water intake. Uh, the green is the big trees. You can kind of, now that we started taking them back in 88, the city of water, Santa Cruz water intake, you can see they're pretty much go in parallel. Um, but you can see the red line indicates to you the level of concern. And you can see during rainy, the rainy part of the season, we see exceedances at both locations in fecal coliform. Similarly, the same, not as clear path pattern, but is occurring again uh, with nitrates as nitrogen, a little higher seen at the big trees than at the city of water at Santa Cruz intake, but nevertheless, uh, concerns that we have for both nitrates and fecal coliform from the San Lorenzo, in the San Lorenzo River. Now switch, uh, switching to a little bit of um, um, our nitrate concern areas in the groundwater basin. This is, um, and, and the surface water as well, is these are the areas that are indicated and we'll be talking a bit about more about this as we indicate that these, if an OTS system is in these areas, uh, there's particular attention that is now being required under the new um, ordinance uh, for these particular areas. Um, they not only oftentimes have nitrate concern areas, but they also have fast perking soils, which also require additional um, um, oversight and, and control uh, before the sewage is discharged to the soil. Uh, nitrate in groundwater is a, as a, a concern. It's less of a concern, but only a 4% contributing factor to how much nitrates we see in the, uh, the Pajaro Basin groundwater system, groundwater area. It's only 4%. Again, we were talking about fertilizer uh, being a much more important contributor. Uh, in the Santa Margarita, we see that um, we know that the Santa Margarita Basin contributes to the base flow. In other words, there's parts where the groundwater actually goes into the surface, feeds into the surface water of the river. And we know that, uh, as I just showed you, the San Lorenzo River is uh, a concern from elevated nitrate. Further, uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District's North District have had to take out several wells in the Quail Hollow area because of nitrates in the, uh, that were exceeding that they had to take them out and no longer are using those particular wells. 
Um, the Mid County Basin, um, again, localized impact so far from Ox. They did have to take a, a the SoCal Water District did have to take a well out of service uh, because of exceedances of nitrates in the um, La Selva uh, water, La Selva Beach area. So for all these reasons, uh, and obviously a state oversight, it is important to us to look at our OTS policy and decide, um, you know, what improvements and uh, to it, and also how do we meet the the state minimum requirements. So these next two slides are just a summary of those. Um, uh, that there, there's a lot more technical detail that is in the ordinance and also um, in the documents that we shared with you. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. These, the ones that I've bulleted here are the ones that um, are already being implemented. And that's because they were really essentially ones we had to do because they were in the state minimum standards. And therefore, when the board approved them on October 14th, they expected us to start implementing them. Well, actually they told us to start implementing them. Um, so some of our groundwater separation and what that refers to is the distance between the bottom of the trench of the leach field and where the groundwater, um, high groundwater level mark are. Uh, the soil is where the pathogens are broken down. Um, and so we need that soil. Uh, so we want some more soil separation between, uh, well, we want some more separation between uh, the bottom of the trench and the um, groundwater. So instead of going from one to three feet, now it's five to eight feet, um, unless there's enhanced treatment. If you're not familiar with enhanced treatment, this is just a step whereby uh, people, rather than discharging sewage um, directly from the septic tank to the leach field, it's actually treated to reduce, um, it can be uh, for different things, certainly can uh, expectation in many cases to reduce the nitrogen, but also to reduce the pathogen level as well before it's discharged to the leach field. Um, we will require that all new and replacement systems and fast perking soils uh, with night in the nitrate concern areas, or again, referring you back to that map that I show you, will require enhanced treatment for nitrogen removal. Uh, enhanced treatment will also be required for all seepage pits, um, for replacement of all seepage pits, and for major remodels of homes with seepage pits. That's what we call an upgrade. Um, the maximum trench depth um, will decrease. We used to allow it up to 10 feet, and now it'll be four feet unless enhanced treatment is used. This will affect parcels with clay soils or other constraints that um, limit dispersal area. Um, and the repairs of failing systems may have to use, may be allowed to use trenches up to 10 feet in depth if they have site constraints. Um, and system repairs uh, will no longer be uh, allowed to be decided, designed by a contractor, but we will need to have them designed by a qualified professional. Uh, and a qualified professional must require, uh, must conduct the soil and percolation testing. Oops. These next set of bullets are the key changes to our ordinance that um, we are not implementing until the ordinance is adopted by the board and also the Coastal Commission. Um, these are, um, we are changing, we're getting rid of some of our site specific assessment and mitigation areas, site constraint areas. John will talk a little bit more about that in the general plan amendments. Uh, because we can, we know we have uh, uh, other abilities to deal with these issues in the ordinance. Um, uh, we will require for all enhanced treatment systems to maintain a service contact, service contract with a qualified service protector, service provider. Um, I will say in the past, uh, the county in some cases took on that role, but now we will be requiring that they have a commercial qualified service provider uh, to do that that yearly. Um, um, review of the, uh, the of this of their uh, um, enhanced treatment system to make sure it's working. Um, we will be developing a local registration and conditional approval of qualified uh, service providers, um, uh, as per the ordinance, um, and we will be um, implementing a mandatory OTS evaluation at the time of property transfer. Uh, this will include a system conditions, permitted status, performance, and an identification identification of likely requirements for future air upgrades. Consider this kind of an akin to if you live in a more urban area, many of the sewer districts require that you do a sewer uh, line inspection 
um, and upgrades if need be um, be at the time of transfer property real estate transfer. So we're this is really a similar process that we're uh, planning to um, require. So with that, I'm going to switch over to John, who is I think allowed to speak. So he's going to talk about the general plan amendments. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and advance the slide. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the general plan does include a number of policies uh, and programs re related to on-site disposal. Uh, so as we're updating our ordinance, we also need to update the general plan. Um, the Ordinance Chapter 7.38 is also a local coastal program implementing or ordinance. So as we make changes to that code, it has to go through the full process of review by the Planning Commission, the board, and then on to the, uh, the Coastal Commission. <clears throat> so we're proposing amendments to both uh, policies of both Chapter 5, the open space uh, conservation and open space chapter, and then chapter seven, the parks, recreation, and public facilities chapter of the general plan. Uh, these are for consistency with the LAMP and updates to uh, chapter 7.38, as well as some cleanup uh, relative to the sustainability update. Uh, as a part of the sustainability update, we did identify some, some areas where um, cleanup was needed, and we have worked with the planning staff to, uh, to update those sections. All of the proposals relative to the sustainability update that also relate to OTS are included in this package, just so you can see everything all together. And in the end, when the, uh, the sustainability update is adopted, we'll, we'll be um, you know, folding all this information together into the, 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 the updated general plan document. <clears throat> so specifically, um, in policy 5.5.15 uh, and 5.516, that references the old constraint areas. These were actually developed back in the 1980s, and I hate to say it, but I was actually around when those were developed. Um, that mapping is not particularly accurate. Um, and we're, we're phasing out the, the limitation, the lot size limitation for constraint areas and any reference to those old constraint areas. Essentially, we're, we're going to have adequate protection, as Marilyn discussed, through uh, site specific requirements, uh, particularly enhanced treatment, where we have the fast percolation soils in recharge areas. And, uh, and we still will be maintaining the one acre minimum in the water supply watershed areas. Um, policies 5.5.17 and 7.21.3 were dealt with uh, specifics regarding slopes and easements, and we just determined that those were uh, overly specific, uh, too specific for the general plan. Those provisions are in Chapter 7.38, so we're not losing those provisions. We're just pulling them out of the general plan, and that, again, was part of the sustainability update to try to have a... a not get into too many specifics in the general plan. 5.5.18 and 5.519 are relatively recent policy updates that were put in. And they essentially uh, do the same thing, although one is within the coastal zone and one is without the coastal outside the coastal zone. And those are going to be combined into just one policy regarding the use of easements uh, for sewage disposal for public facilities. Um, throughout the county. The, these were essentially put into the general plan back when the Felton Library was developed. And uh, the Felton Library site could not accommodate uh, a septic system that met standards on that property. So they needed to use an easement off the property. We do not allow easements still for um, individual residential or private developments, again, just for public, public, public facilities. Um, <clears throat> 5.7.2, we're updating the language uh, regarding uh, upgrade of systems within 100 feet of a waterway. New development will still have to stay over 100 feet from a waterway, but if a uh, 
existing development already has a, an aughts within 100 feet of the waterway. Uh, they could add bedrooms if they upgrade the system using enhanced treatment. Um, so we're, we're cleaning that language up uh, to be consistent with the code and with the lamp and with the, with practice that has gone on to date. And then in, in uh, policy 7.21.4, <clears throat> we're essentially removing the term alternative system and replacing it with enhanced treatment systems. Uh, these sort of advanced technologies have been around for many years now. Uh, we have over 600 of them in our county. So they're really no longer alternative. Um, they, they're they're perf they're completely acceptable, and they're enhanced treatment systems that give a higher level of effluent quality prior to disposal of, of effluent to the soil. Uh, we expect that with a lot of these changes, we'll be seeing an increased use of enhanced treatment systems, because many of our properties just cannot meet uh, current standards for conventional septic systems, conventional disposal. So we will be. Uh, seeing more use of enhanced treatment systems. Um, I will say that we have completed environmental review on this package. The environmental coordinator uh, determined that it was exempt uh, from further environmental review because it, it is providing for increased protection of the environment. We also have uh, sent letters out to all of the, the tribal organizations, giving them an opportunity to comment on this uh, package of amendments. Uh, we did not respond, receive any response from the tribes. Uh, we have reached out to Coastal Commission staff. They're aware of what's, uh, what's being proposed, uh, but so far we have not gotten any feedback from Coastal Commission staff. So I'll go ahead and, and turn it back to Marilyn to, to wrap it up. And I'll be available to answer uh, any questions going forward. Thanks, John. And I, I failed to actually adequately recommend uh, uh, introduce John. Many of you know him, I'm assuming, for many, many years of being uh, such a in critical role to the county as far as water quality, water resources issues. Um, and we've had the pleasure of working with John. John retired, I think it was fall. December of like 2019, maybe, um, maybe it was 20, I can't remember, because we he's continued to work with us in a consulting role, and we do appreciate him. And he did essentially write the lamp um, and help uh, lead the effort in the rewriting the ordinance. So if it, it, technical issues come up, he's definitely the person. Um, with that, I want to just say, I'm going to recommend that the, the, the Planning Commission take the following action, conduct a public hearing to review the proposed amendments, to the sewage amendment to Santa Cruz County General Plan, Local Coastal Plan, Chapter 5 and 7, and Ch Santa Cruz County Code 7.38 to bring county provisions into conformance with the state policy and the county local agency management program for on-site wastewater treatment systems as approved by the state, the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board with the associated CEQA notice of exemption and adopt the attached resolution recommending that the Board of Supervisors adopt the ordinance modifying County Code Chapter 7.38 sewage disposal to conform with the state policy for on-site wastewater treatment systems and the Santa Cruz Local Agency Management Program, and that they, you approve the proposed amendments, that they approve the proposed amendments to Chapter 5 and 7 of the General Plan Local Coastal Plan, Attachment D2, and direct staff to file the California Environmental Quality Act Notice of Exemption, Exhibit E, with the clerk of the board, and direct staff to transmit the amendments to the California Coastal Commission. Um, with that, we will take questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, for an excellent presentation. And thank you, uh, John. Good to see you again. I'm glad to know your expertise is being put to good use um, by the county. So are there any questions um, of commissioners to staff at this time? Pardon, I had it, just a couple small things on the ordinance, if that's okay. So I, I had just a couple, first, I mean, let me just say my great appreciation. I know um, that getting the lamp approved and then now doing the revisions with the odds has been a significant amount of work, as you said, over a, a number of years. And so I just really want to state my appreciation both um, 
uh, to Ms. Underwood and, and to Mr. Ricker, I know it's just been um, a heavy lift. I just had a couple, um, I had a couple of comments and then, and then one kind of more question. Um, a, a small thing that I'd like to see uh, kind of revised or changed before it goes to the board for approval is that um, throughout the changes, there's reference to MPI without actually um, defining it. In the previous ordinance before it was struck, there's actually a de definition of MPI. I know that in it, you also reference minutes for int, so I know what it meant. Um, but when we're having these type of ordinance, it's really important that we are clear uh, when we have um, these acronyms that we define them. So I would appreciate that bef before it goes to the board that the MPI be clearly defined um, and that we don't just use the ordinance throughout. But that's just a small thing that I, I think needs cleaning up. Um, another thing that I, I just think for that same vein of transparency, in, in defining um, nitrate concern areas, um, letter V in the definition, I just had a question about the way it's going to work in transparency, the, the the definition goes on to say that these are these areas where effluent discharge from OTS and fast percolating soils, and then it goes on to say, including the San Lorenzo River watershed, the North Coast water supply watershed, Valencia Creek watershed, and Los Alba Beach area, as shown on a map of nitrate concern areas maintained by the Director of Environmental Health Division. And I just have a question, I guess, about that, because although the San Lorenzo um, river watershed is defined in the ordinance, those other areas are not. And so I just have a question about how this map will be available to the public because we have an ordinance that is referencing a map that is not included in the ordinance, nor does it say where that map will be available. And so for the public or for professionals who are using this ordinance in order to build these facilities, I just want to know if you could answer kind of how that map will be available for, for reference I mean, and, and to the public. So if you, if you don't mind just kind of answering that question, that would be helpful for me. Okay, I'm probably gonna let John talk this, but I believe it's available already on our GIS, our GIS website. So it's a layer that people can add, the interested folks can add. Is that not correct, John? That is correct. It is on the, uh, the county's um, GIS website. That, that language in terms of maps maintained by the director is, that's language that's been in the ordinance for many years that predate any kind of GIS website. So it used to be, I guess, somebody could come to the counter and ask to see the map or we would have it posted at the counter. Uh, but now we really try to make all this information available electronically and all of our consultants um, and designers and qualified professionals are, are very familiar with that. And it is available to the public, uh, those that can, can navigate the county's GIS system. Well, why not just say in a parenthesis available at and put a link? Um, I guess I would... would I would want to consult with county council and planning staff to see what the current convention is. Um, but that might make sense to do that. I mean, one of the issues is we may identify additional nitrate concern areas as information, new information became available, although I think we've got a pretty good handle on it at this point. But uh, we can check into that on what the best way to reference that information would be. Well, clearly the reference at, that is uh, at the behest of the director is pretty archaic and most people will expect some electronic. It can be very general, but tell people where to go to find out, I think, however it's manifested. Yeah, one of the problems is those links get revised, uh, you know, yeah. frequently as the websites are updated. So I, I would say uh, thank you for the comment. I think um, we can definitely think about is there a way to phrase it differently without providing link in all honesty? Because um, you want an ordinance not to have to be obsolete because the link goes bad. But I think it's a point well taken that is, is that statement imply that you can find the map electronically? I think it doesn't preclude that, but I'm certainly happy to, to look into that and see if we can phrase it a different way. <clears throat> Thank you, and I appreciate hearing that it's kind of standard language. I just. Um... So that, that's good to know. Um, it, it's just something to consider. So I appreciate both your comments, both the fact that it's standard as well as perhaps there's, maybe we have to consider updating the standard. I don't I don't know what that solution is. I agree. <laughs> exactly. I agree. I agree. We don't want the a link to be something that could be outdated, but um, yeah. I, so I, I just thank you for taking my yeah. comment into consideration. I just, I just had one additional kind of question, and this is probably my, my biggest question, is that when I was reading the ordinance, um, 7.38.080C, 
Um, it was, it had to do with calamity. Um, and I just, I was hoping maybe you could speak. I know we're going this direction of obviously updated odds and, but the, the question that really, that I, what I was left with, because it's this part of the code is kind of self-referential. So it references later part of the code, you read that part of the code and it references back. And so I was hoping maybe you could clarify for me under what circumstances post calamity would someone not be required to replace their odds? So, okay, not be required to, you know, it was too negative. So, so, so there's a, there is a, an earthquake, there, a, a, there's a fire, a, a, a tree strikes a home. So calamity occurs under right. what, and under what reconstruction circumstance would someone not be required to replace their hot? Because for me, when I was reading the code, I, and I read a lot of code, and I still yeah. was not clear in reading the code under what circumstances someone would not be required to replace their ought. Is it, is it if the ought was only installed a couple years ago? Is it based on if they're doing like for like reconstruction? Um, it, I'm just wondering if you could provide sure. kind of a layman's so, terms answer to that, if, if, it, if it's even possible. Right, so like for, so just, it's actually, we have a real world, world example, obviously. This, this plot, these part of this, um, the ordinance did not change that much. In fact, I'm not even sure changed at all um, from the current ordinance. So um, the CZU is an appropriate thing to talk about here. So the concept here in a way is these, if people are building like for like, and they can demonstrate that they didn't have, they had a permitted non-failing or, or it predates permit, the permitting time, and their septic system was not failing, then essentially it's not the septic system that they're just trying to rebuild like for like, right? So that's, that's one issue, and then they can do that without um, needing to do anything to their septic system. If um, they, in fact, have a failing septic system, that we have some records that there was maybe a failing septic system that unfortunately coincided with the time of the CZU burn, they would have to address that as a repair. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in that case, again, repair standards apply, which are not, which are more lenient than if you were upgrading, again, if you're building like for like and you just needed a repair, um, they're still a lot more lenient in the current, in the new law code that we're proposing uh, than if you were doing an upgrade or upgrade. So in the CZU, the other thing, they're not never gonna be new development because new development would apply. Um, but if they wanted to do an upgrade, so they have, they had, you know, they, they had a three bedroom system, the septic system was built for a three bedroom and they wanna up, now build a four bedroom. That's considered an upgrade. Um, now we would be looking at current standards and saying, okay, do you have adequate setback for the streams? Do you have adequate setback from other your well and other your neighbor's wells? Um, those are the kind of things we would start looking at and applying in that situation where they wanted to upgrade. But otherwise, like for like is you had a three bedroom, you want to put back a three bedroom. Uh, the one thing we would look at is to make sure that you're meeting stream setbacks. Um, and some of those other important groundwater separation setbacks. Um, and you might have to do something additional, um, but for the most part, those are the only restrictions. We wouldn't restrict you based on lot size. We wouldn't restrict you uh, from, from rebuilding as long as you can demonstrate that you, you meet current standards in the, scene, in the sense of stream setback and groundwater separation. Does that help? It does. Can you just clarify for me? Oh, if they were like for like, as long as the system wasn't failing, it's okay. But if they were upgrading, then they have because 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 like in our I'm I'm not simply asking about CZU I'm asking countywide that's yeah. part of our responsibility and I'm thinking throughout our county especially in the in the area I, that that I'm kind of represent we we have like high water tables and, and high perk rates and so um, I, I just want to be clear that you're talking about only if they're upgrading would they then be required to meet current standards of of water separation and stream setbacks and things like that and did I understand you correctly. Um, I misspoke actually. I, the, so the first thing we look to see if is, is it a uh, failing system? Is there any information that would suggest it's a failing system? The second is even if it's like for like, they do need to meet stream setback and groundwater separation. Uh, and again, that is some, not just us, but the state odds policy as well. Thank you for clarifying, I appreciate yeah. it. Do any other commissioners have questions for staff at this point? Uh, yes. Well, uh, Commissioner Shepard, do you have some questions for staff? Yes. Um, just unmuting myself. Uh, just first of all, um, it's a pleasure to hear Mr. Richter again. Uh, 
always a pleasure to see or hear from him again. I'm really glad he's still consultant in Maryland. This was a great report. It read very well. I did have one. This isn't direct to just at this report or staff reports, but um, people who are used to the county know all the um, acronyms. I'd like to suggest that some of these ordinance changes maybe have a cover sheet where you list what the acronym is and then once and you can always refer to it. Um, I know I always have to go back and see what does VOIC or LAP whatever mean and then I have to memorize it so because it, it's never referred to again. You only say it in the first or second page and then in the next hundred pages it's never repeated. I, I just think a definitions page wouldn't hurt because I would myself tear it out and set it beside me. In this case, there's only one, but in many cases, especially with these other planning documents, there's lots, and I, I don't I don't remember what they mean. So that was just a suggestion. My question is, um, could you go over because I think it'd be good to, to know it um, because I get a lot of questions about it, both ADUs um, and probably is going to be relevant for tiny houses. Um, am I correct in thinking that if you want to add an ADU, your septic um, system will need to accommodate the extra use by the code standards? Or can you just speak to that specific issue? And I know it's too early to talk about tiny homes, but this is going to be a big question. Sure. So yes, yeah, so any upgrades, whether it be adding to um, bedrooms to the, the main house or adding an ADU or adding a, a tiny home, um, all of those would be required first to look at the adequacy of the septic system. Um, we don't require, we, at this point, we were requiring a septic tank for both um, the primary home as well as the ADU or tiny home. Um, and then they could use the same leach field if the leach field was adequately sized. Um, if it's not adequately sized, they can either upgrade the leach field um, to meet that or create a second entirely separate system for the ADU that would treat the ADU's um, sewage effluent. Um, this is not necessarily true if an enhanced treatment is needed, um, then they can probably get away with not having a septic, se separate septic tank. Uh, but otherwise, yes, the whole point would be is all of us want still, it doesn't matter if you're in an ADU or in a primary, you would want your the sewage to be adequately treated uh, so that you can protect the environment, also your water well as well. So you do well, have to um, upgrade to meet standards. Um, that's clear. And may I suggest you might include that because people are going to be looking for it. And I did find it kind of, but it took me a while. And I, I just think that's a question. People are going to want to go in and say, what will I need to do about septic if I'm adding an ADU? Why not just call it out? Yeah, it is described, but you're saying in the ordinance or in the staff report? I'm not. I'm in, not the, in the ordinance, maybe make, some, make a call out as how for ADUs, at least right now, it's just ADUs because people are going to be looking for it in the code. Why not make it easy? Yes. Okay. And, and, and just so you know, in addition to this, we also put out you know, information on our website specifically addressing ADUs. Um, and, and so th that's also in addition, we will be doing that as well in addition to the ordinance. Yeah, um, I think you do a great job on that informational okay. side. I just think we ought to include this because we are, we, we have expanded that availability so much. Gotcha, thank you. Any other questions for staff by commissioners? Okay, well, let's open up the public hearing then. Um, Lizanne, are there members of the public who wish to address the commission on this? Oops, you're muted, Lizanne. There we go. Um, I am not seeing any hands raised. My goodness, that's hard to believe. This is such an important issue. <laughs> Well, you know, we do hear about it's it's fascinating because this is one of these, you know, countywide policy issues that when we're changing the policy, nobody's here, but when it gets implemented, yeah, sure, we hear from folks. Um, okay, so well, if there's uh, no hands raised, uh, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. I just want to say that that was an excellent presentation. Um, you know, as uh, Commissioner Violanti was bringing up some of the issues that you know, our district is experiencing with the CZU fire. So 
you know, when this does, when the rubber hits the road, it's it's an incredibly important issue. And of course it protects um, our drinking water because as you pointed out, most of our drinking water is surface and groundwater, which is um, affected by by ops. And thank you for updating us um, on the most current um, terms that we should now be using. So I will incorporate that into my vocabulary. Um, so I just want to thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. And um, I'll wait to hear from my uh, commissioners to see what action they want to take. Okay, well, um, I want to echo uh, what Commissioner Chair Dan has said. This was an excellent report. I'm going to keep it so I can refer to it again. Um, so thank you for all the work that went into it. Um, let's see, what do we have to do about this? Uh, approve the staff recommendation. Okay. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the staff um, report. And I think um, Commissioner Violante had one additional suggestion to incorporate um, into a motion about, um, I don't know if she wants to articulate that. I just made the recommendation that they uh, include defining the acronym before, before it goes back to the, before it gets taken to the Board of Supervisors of MPI and how they want to do that in the ordinance is their decision. So it just, it's important that it be defined at some point because it's used throughout the report. So would you like to incorporate that into your motion, Commissioner Shepard? Yes, I think that's important. And also, may I incorporate my suggestion that they specifically address ADUs? Uh, it, it's not changing anything. It's just making a, you know, a subtitle. So it'll be easily findable. And then if the other commissioners don't have any objections, let's let's just have a definite, you know, an acronym page or the appropriate title for such a page where it's got the, an acronym and then what it means included with the staff report. I think that's helpful to the, anybody reading this. Great. So that's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Excellent. So it's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Motion carries with four and none opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Underwood and Mr. Rickert. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And now we will move on to our final item, or not our final item, but our final substantive item, item 10, which is the study session on the sustainability update. And I believe we're starting with Natisha. And Natisha, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Lizanne. And um, Anais will be sharing the presentation. So I'll give her a second to share before we start. Okay. Okay, so it looks like, um, can everyone see the presentation? We can, yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, today we'll be discussing the sustainability policy and regulatory update. My name is Natisha Williams, senior planner in the Community Development and Infrastructure Department, or CDI and Anish Shank, <clears throat> a transportation planner who's also involved in this project will be presenting with me this morning or this afternoon now. Um, so the presentation um, is the third of a series of study sessions with the Planning Commission on the Sustainability Update Project. Today, we'll focus on the access and mobility element of the general plan, the parks, recreation and public facilities element, as well as related county code amendments. Um, so here's today's agenda for the study session. Um, we'll touch on major topics that are addressed in the new access and mobility element, including a review of the transportation framework, transportation system management, and parking. Then we'll highlight uh, major changes to the code and new code sections, including updates to parking requirements. And um, next we'll review the Portola Drive streetscapes concepts, as well as coastal access and placemaking. And, um, after this, we'll have an opportunity for questions and a focused discussion on transportation policy, if the commission likes, before moving on to the next section, which will be an overview of the key changes to the parks, recreation, and public facilities element. And um, then at the end of the presentation, we'll have additional opportunity for discussion and to answer any questions. 
Um, so now I will pass the presentation off to Ari Schenk to discuss transportation changes. Thanks, Nikisha. Um, so I'm going to apologize. My allergies have been really bad. I might have a bit of a gravelly voice and or have to sneeze in the middle of my presentation. Um, so I'm going to start off just by talking a little bit about the framework for the access and mobility element. Um, there's a, a summary on the screen here of the general areas that are touched on in the general plan. Um, one thing you'll note is that we no longer call it the circulation element. It's now called the access and mobility element. Um, similar thing uh, with the, uh, the land use element, which is now the built environment element. So the four major areas in the uh, access and mobility element are transportation system management, uh, multimodal planning. There's a huge emphasis on integrating the various modes. Uh, rather than keeping them separate as it was in the last general plan. Um, and then placemaking in general, um, also I, I kind of think of coastal access as part of our placemaking strategies, um, environmental justice, economic vitality, and innovation. Uh, and then as Natisha mentioned, we're also going to talk a little bit about the county code regulation changes, which is part of the code moder modernization part of the sustainability update. Um, the uh, the code for transportation, namely parking, circulation, and access, was all over the code previously. So um, these are the three main areas where they were. There were actually other areas as well, but the three main chapters are listed here. Um, and then thirdly, we had the design guidelines that were created as a whole new um, set of guidelines that list out street standards. Um, they're guidelines, so they're not regulatory, but they do provide uh, a really nice set of relationships between the uh, functional form of buildings and the streetscape. Uh, so I think they'll be helpful to applicants. Uh, so just to go into a little bit more detail with the transportation framework, the um, layered network approach is sort of the basis for all of our transportation planning and the access and mobility element. This is a concept that we actually developed or the county developed in the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. Um, and it came about because uh, they really wanted to have a complete streets approach. Uh, complete streets planning takes the philosophy that uh, all users should have equal access and um, be prioritized on our roadway so that there is no preference to just vehicles. Um, however, in a uh, in a network where we have very constrained right of ways, we can't provide the ideal um, sidewalk widths or bicycle lane widths to uh, users as we would like. So uh, instead, a layered network approach was conceived. And what this does is it uh, prioritizes certain user types on specific streets. So the end result is a, um, a network for, let's say, active transportation, another network for transit, and so on and so on, so that each user type has a comprehensive network that's layered on top of each other. And then that allows us to build out a better set of facilities for those user types without compromising space. Uh, another key component of the transportation framework is that there's a lot more coordination between the built environment element, previously called the land use element, um, and the uh, access and mobility element. So um, there's concepts such as 15 minute neighborhoods in the built environment element that were directly influenced by this layered network approach and key destinations. Um, and then finally, um, there are new roadways that are called out in the access and mobility element maps um, or map, I should say. Um, and this is really to help try to reduce uh, the distance that people have to walk or bike. Um, they're mostly local roadways and in a very select few places. So um, I mentioned the layered network approach. I just wanted to give you an example of the four, four of the um, main types of roadways, um, typologies as they're often called. There are a few other types that are not called out right here. 
um, and these are all listed out in the general plan. Um, the multimodal corridor type is a, um, a typology that really prioritizes longer distance travel. Um, so these tend to be wider roadways where we can provide better facilities for transit and um, protected facilities for bicyclists. Uh, an example of this is Capitola Road. So Kell would also be another example that you could um, easily conjure up in your mind. Um, and then the next one that is a pretty common in the county that you'll see a lot of in the map, and this is signified by the orange lines um, in that figure in this last slide, um, is the active connector. Um, the active connector really prioritizes bicyclists and pedestrians, so wider um, facilities for those two user types. Uh, Brommer is a good example of an active connector. Uh, and then we also have some main streets. Um, and so these are really for walkability. Um, so we, um, we prioritize much wider sidewalks. Um, so pedestrian oriented streets, pedestrian scaled amenities, um, transit access to those, those goods and facilities. Um, and then we have the local residential streets, which um, would be sm smaller scale residential communities um, where bicyclists would share the lanes with vehicles. Um, you have a, a base level sidewalk width, um, but these are lower speed commerce streets and those are signified by gray lines on the maps. So, um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about transportation system management. Um, which is a really broad term that covers a lot of topics. So I will try to keep this short. Um, uh, the major metric that has been used in the past to measure the performance of our system um, and performance of the system is one of the major components of system management. Um, so the, the primary metric that was used in the past is called level of service or LOS. Um, that's a metric that I'm sure you have heard a lot about in past uh, applicant or project level review. Um, level of service grades the operations of a roadway on a scale of A to F. You'll see that grading system on this slide here based on how much delay a vehicle experiences. Um, and the problem with this system as was realized about uh, 15 to 20 years ago is that it, it really emphasizes the vehicle user experience. Um, and while it does get at um, greenhouse gas emissions vis-a-vis -vis idling, uh, it doesn't really address greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector based on how far people are driving. And um, the proposed approach to reduce or to make level of service better to improve the operations of a roadway network was to uh, to grow capacity because when you grow capacity, then there's less delay. However, there's this phenomena that when you grow capacity, more people will then use that roadway. So um, we would get we were getting caught in this cycle of growing capacity to improve our level of service and get it back to a grade of A, and then it would go back down to lower grades of D to F because more people would use the roadway system. This is a phenomena called induced demand. Uh, so increasing capacity was not working and it was actually resulting in increased greenhouse gas emissions. This is something that um, is being addressed at the statewide level vis-a-vis -vis legislation. Um, and so what happened with this legislation was that um, we took level of service out of the um, options for and any kind of measure of delay out of the options for um, looking at impacts, environmental impacts in transportation. And it was replaced with vehicle miles traveled, which looks at the distance that people travel. So now instead of measuring the performance of our system, uh, using level of service, we look at VMT. Now this is true mainly for CEQA, 
um, the California Environmental Quality Act uh, purposes. So when we're looking at a project for its environmental impacts, we still use level of service as an operational component for looking at a project. Um, however, in the um, proposed general plan uh, access mobility element, we have proposed to reduce the level of service um, threshold to D. And there are some, some nuances to that. Um, but there is a almost a page of information of that about that on in the general plan access mobility element. Um, so that's that's a lot of information, but um, it's the short end of that is to say that um, we are moving to a much greater focus on BMT, and this is true not just at the County of Santa Cruz, but statewide. Um, so there, you'll see that woven throughout the access mobility element. Can I just ask you a quick question there? Sure. Um, I want to, you to go, don't want to interrupt your flow, but I'd like when we get to the end to see um, a specific example of what, what that means. I, I read this carefully and I saw that you kind of generally said, but that's something people, are, whenever there's something proposed, people are allowed to talk a lot about traffic. I understand that the level of service was not functioning at all, but can you give me an example of how you would evaluate something later on uh, with the new system? A specific, very focused example. I understood the level of service, even though it didn't work, um, but this is more complex and I, I'd like to see how you would apply it, but I don't wanna interrupt you now, but I'm saying that that's one I, I did not quite understand because there was no example. Yeah, I let me talk about that at the end. It is, it actually is complex. Um, so, but I somebody's got it. We, we need to understand yeah, it. Definitely. Otherwise, you're only the, I'm going to be the only people who do understand it, which will not work very well. <laughs> right. And we, we actually have talked about having a whole study session dedicated just to this topic um, because it is complex. Um, so there are actually, there's a number of things that affect how far people drive um, VMT. Uh, and one of those things is, is transportation demand management, um, which is often used as a mitigation measure when, um, and this actually kind of does get at your question. Um, so it's often used as a mitigation measure when people exceed the thresholds that the county has set for VMT. Um, however, transportation demand management is also a, um, a kind of a conceptual philosophy or approach that's woven throughout the entire code and um, general plan. So while there are a couple of specific policies that outright say the county will support and implement TDM programs, um, there are a number of ways that we are supporting um, TDM or transportation demand management throughout these updates. Um, so for example, um, and let me just go step back for a second and define transportation demand management. Uh, it used to be used as a term that just meant to simply use the system, the transportation system more efficiently uh, to manage choices and demand um, such that you were putting less demand on the system. Um, now we use the term so that um, we, to mean that we're actually reducing demand um, with the intended goal of reducing the amount that people tra have to travel by vehicle um, and um, single occupant vehicle, I should say. Um, so we try to increase choices for carpooling, transit, um, bicycling, walking, uh, et cetera. Um, so the way that we've done that throughout the general plan includes things by um, includes things like long-term parking demand strategies. Um, in the code includes um, uh, items such as increased exceptions for parking. Um, we've also um, you'll see like even something like having design guidelines where we are trying to create a more walkable environment actually encourages people to walk rather than drive a couple miles. Uh, so these are some of the ways that TDM is philosophically woven throughout the general plan update. Um, 
The other element of transportation system management that's in the access mobility element is um, an inclusion of Vision Zero and safety. Um, Vision Zero is something you'll start hearing more and more about as the state starts to support it and even tie funding to having a Vision Zero action plan. Uh, Vision Zero is a philosophy that um, fatalities and injuries due to vehicle collisions are preventable and that we should strive to reduce those to, to nothing. Um, so that is something you'll start hearing more languaging around. Um, it's interdisciplinary and interdepartmental, so it requires a lot of effort to get off the ground, um, but there are local examples specifically in Watsonville. Um, so now I just wanna spend a little bit of time on parking and I'll try to speed up my, my pace here. <laughs> um, so the policies that we have in, in relationship to parking um, are kind of in two categories. There's um, policies that are implemented through the proposed code. And then there's a couple policies that are long-term that we do not have implemented through the proposed code. Um, so the first four address policies that are, or address items that are implemented in the current code proposal. Um, so we really did try to change the parking ratios to right size them for the land uses. Um, our parking ratios were pretty off um, as compared to other jurisdictions or industry standards. Um, we also uh, actually already allowed for shared parking in our current code, although that was a little known fact um, because it was buried in the code. So we just put that, consolidated that with the parking ratios, um, but that is a common parking strategy which allows for a reduction of the use of land and more efficient use of land. Um, we have uh, have a policy related to increasing access to publicly owned parking lots. Um, we also have a policy related to conducting parking quantitative parking studies so that we can understand our parking demand and supply better, which would then allow us to implement the longer term goals, which are programs that manage parking demand vis-a-vis -vis paid parking, parking districts, or um, um, par moving parking pricing up and down based on occupancy. Those are all very long term goals for which we need more data and actually more support of alternative modes of transportation. Um, so then this slide, um, it's slightly blocked by my Zoom window here. Um, this slide shows some of the ratios um, that have changed. Um, we tried to really simplify it here. Uh, so obviously we had some changes to residential parking requirements. Um, we went from having a two space minimum for um, the single family home to one space minimum and then increasing from there. Um, this is more in line with what we're seeing around the um, states um, and also with, with new, more and more state legislation that's getting passed. Um, we also added a category for townhouses and this is tied to um, some of the code in the, that relates to um, land use um, because that's a, a term or a category that wasn't found previously and was confusing people. Um, we retained requirements for guest parking. That was a comment that came up um, or has come up for people is that they're really concerned about maintaining uh, guest parking. So that is maintained in both townhouses and multifamily uh, and that's from the existing code. Um, the change regarding multifamily is that instead of having spaces tied to number of bedrooms, we're tying them to the size of the unit. Um, and this is a recommendation that came to us to really try to encourage or allow for um, uh, affordable by design type units where we can um, encourage smaller units for people who may not need as much space or be able to afford as much space. Um, and this reduces the amount of land that a developer needs for, uh, for small units. Um, and then this has a number of other retail commercial service type categories, and this is by no means an exhaustive table. 
Um, but in some of these categories, we didn't reduce parking across the board. Actually, in some categories, we increased parking or slightly tweaked it um, to really address the, the use specific to it. In other cases, we consolidated various uses that had similar parking requirements, but didn't actually change the parking requirements. Um, so this list tries to just present those that were the, there was some kind of change um, to the parking requirement. So um, as an example, public assembly, a really standard parking requirement is you have one space for three seats or for each three persons of design occupancy. Um, we also had um, an outdated parking set of parking requirements for um, nursing homes or assisted living facilities. Oh, and another thing we did is we updated the terminology a little bit. We had some antiquated terms for um, things like assisted living facilities. I can't remember exactly what term it was in there. Um, Excuse me, can I interrupt you just here? Because I think that this is actually a question that I had. Um, and maybe it's because I'm lazy about doing math. But can you go through each one of these and just, it looks to me that you're reducing the parking requirements for everything in this grid here. Can you just go through each one and say, this is a reduction, this is an increase, so that it's clear for us and the public what is what is actually going on? Because it's hard to just calculate on the fly what the change sure. is. Sure. Um, so for uh, public assembly, it's hard to say, this is probably, that one looked like a reduction. It's right? per, like per, per, per seat. Um, but I just, it, just, just tell me as a public assembly, are we increasing parking requirements or reducing? Increasing. Parking? It's, it's actually, I mean, it's, it for. Well, this per, is, if you can't explain it to me, then, <laughs> right? We need to be able to, to say to the public, for public assembly, we're going to be increasing parking requirements, or we're going to be decreasing parking requirements by X. Does that make sense for future I, meetings? I, I, I agree because it seems all I could think was, well, one space for each three seats means you think that if three people are going to two two of three people will take public transportation to get to a public assembly. Right. Right. So and previously, at, and that that means you think people are going to do that at night and when it rains. Et cetera, et cetera. So previously, if it was 0.25 spaces per seat for three seats, that would be 0.75 spaces. Now we have one space for three seats. So it's an increase. Yes. So you're so you're going to add parking for new right. assembly. Okay, that's that's all that I'm asking. Like so, so and going down the list, nursing homes and assisted living facilities is also an increase. Um, hospitals is a probably an increase because it's based on employees instead of office space. Okay. So the number of spaces per bed is a decrease, but we're also changing the number of parking requirements to be tied to employees versus office space. So we looked at a couple of examples of recently passed or uh, proposed uh, expansions and this would have resulted in an increase. Um, let's see for retail, commercial services, et cetera, this is actually the same um, except for the second area. So there's there retail, this used to be two categories, retail, commercial services, shopping centers, convenience stores, supermarkets, et cetera. And the second category was supermarkets and convenience stores, which had a one per 200 square foot. Um, okay. So that has now been combined and the new requirement for all of these categories is one per 300 per square feet. So that means that um, the supermarkets and um, convenience stores uh, will now have a increased requirement. Whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to go back to the next slide. Um, Why is it that is a decrease? Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, I meant for the, uh, yes, that is a decrease. Um, I was kind of looking ahead to the, the next one here. Um, and then we 
for another change here actually is that cafes with uh, 12 seats or less were split up with split up from cafes or coffee shops with 13 or more um, seats. So the idea is there is that cafes with um, uh, high turnover, which tend to have fewer seats, uh, would have a lower parking requirement than uh, coffee shops, which have a lower turnover or um, cafes, restaurants, bars, et cetera, which have a lower turnover where people stay longer. Yeah, I think we get that part. Yeah. So they have a higher parking requirement um, at one per 100 square feet. Okay, but so the change for restaurants and bars though, is that increasing the parking requirement from what restaurants used to have or lowering it? So we are increasing the parking requirement for coffee shops or cafes with 13 or more seats. And we are not increasing the parking requirement for dine-in restaurants. Sorry, Anais, can you explain that to me? Because I, I, I see it as the opposite. So I see it as dine-in restaurants used to have one per 100 square feet plus 0.3 per employee versus what we've gotten rid of the additional 0.3. So I would see that as a decrease in-, in Right, so we are not increasing the parking requirements. For restaurants. So this is extremely important though because this comes up quite a bit at the Planning Commission, especially with restaurants because parking is always an issue. So I just want to be very clear for the Commission and for the public what the change is being proposed to be. And so that is a reduction for parking for restaurants is the proposal. Correct. So for restaurant, for restaurants with for restaurants and any kind of cafe with um, 13 or more, the requirement is one per 100 um, because restaurants used to have an additional requirement uh, for parking for employees. This is a reduction. Okay, so in the future, when this comes back to us in the future, I, I would want this to be spelled out in a way that's clear because it seems like it wasn't clear to any of the commissioners up here who are pretty experienced. So it's probably not clear to the public as well. I, I would agree. Could you just explain your rationale for getting rid of employee parking requirements? Because any cafe of any size has three or four people there who work there. Where, why, why not specify parking for them? It's to it's simplify the parking requirements, not to tie it to the user. Most parking requirements are not tied for, for these types of uses are not tied to a specific user, but just simplified at a rate per square foot. So um, it's one per 100 or one per 200 or one per 300. Um, if there's a desire to talk about the rate, I, I would recommend doing that rather than tying it to overcomplicating it by tying it to a rate plus number of employees, which is a variable that changes all the time. So I'm going to make a suggestion for us right now, since this is a study session, we're trying to study the material. And then in August, we're going to have the opportunity to actually take action, make any changes to the recommendation that we see fit. So right now, um, I just want to make sure that, that the commission and the public actually understands the material in front of us. And so, um, that's why I, I asked such specific questions about this because it wasn't clear to me in the packet. And so then in the future when this is uh, revised or, or um, well, yeah, revised for when we see this again, if this could be spelled out um, much more clearly, that would be that would be very helpful. I would, I would agree with Ms. Dan because although I am a numbers geek and I I would, I would, so I, I would just say that I would, I would appreciate staff being Spending some time being able to articulate this. I feel like I agree with Ms. Dan that even staff struggled to answer some of these questions. And it would be good that when they come back that they were able to say not only in the in like a column, maybe saying increase, decrease, but also being able to speak to it in kind of an articulate way. When we discuss it later, I agree with Ms. with, with Chair Dan that this is a study session and it would be good to 
continue on with our material um, so that we can study it and have these questions answered and then have discussion in the future. Um, but I would just encourage them to not only bring back the material, but also bring back, spend some time so they can speak to it in the future in kind of a very articulate, succinct way, because it, it sounds like there's, we want to ensure that there's not confusion. Well, I, yeah. I agree with what you both just said, but I am prepared to hear the staff report and then make some suggestions and, and some of the things I think don't really make sense to me given my careful reading of of the input and I don't want to wait till August if I have specific suggestions oh. of things that aren't clear that's all no no I wasn't meaning to to suggest that um, it was just more of um, to make sure that we at least um, have the understand the information so that we can then um, you know I mean I couldn't have made any suggestions on this because I didn't understand it that's all right. I but there are the other parts that, um, yeah, I have general comments as well. Okay, so um, thank you, Anais, for letting us clarify that with you. And um, yes, please proceed. Can, can I add something as well? Because yeah. I'm, I'm a little, I have a question that's, uh, I noticed that as you get closer to the ocean, things get tighter and more difficult. But as you, you know, get on the other side of SoCal Drive or, you know, things lighten up because you don't have the um, tourist industry bombardment. And I'm just wondering, does all of this make a difference in where it's located, if it's along certain corridors, or is it just a random, uh, has anything ever been designated in different sections of our community? Because it doesn't, it doesn't look that way. It just... Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you mean, is, have there been specific, like different parking requirements implemented based on the location? Yeah, I mean, if you go, if you go along Porter, um, Porter Street, yeah, I, I mean, not Porter Street, um, Portola. What am I thinking? Uh, I think Portola. that I know. Yeah, Portola. If you go down Portola and you get in the Pleasure Point area, I mean, you just can't find parking along a lot of the areas. And then you get further to Soquel Drive and you can. And so our community is based on this tourist industry and density issues. So um, I have a hard time understanding how, like if you go down Wharf Road, it's, it's in Capitola, so it wouldn't make any difference. But if you go down one area and you see that um, a convalescent type home, and there's just no parking anywhere in Pleasure Point. And then you get a little further away and there is. So it, it it's probably a really difficult thing to designate any type of parking per square footage in our community if it's, I mean, you have to apply this general standard, but in our community, things are really, um, affected by relationship to the ocean and geography. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the historical application of, of parking standards, but, um, you know, certainly there is greater demand in certain areas of the county, and that's where some of the policies could really be helpful for long-term parking management strategies, such as parking districts, shared parking, um, even having some county managed parking lots. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something I'd encourage the county to think about in the long term. Um, and then just to speak to some of the comments earlier, we do have a much more involved table that shows all the com all of the changes from the existing parking code to where we're at now with the proposed, um, the complexity with trying to follow some of those changes is that a lot of the land uses have been um, consolidated. So um, they're not as easy to track in a simple spreadsheet. Um, we can certainly provide that as an attachment uh, and I'll, I'll practice articulating this in a way that simplifies it more. Um, well, if it's but, complicated to explain to us, how are you going to explain it over the counter every day? Yeah, I think um, 
the point is to create a final table that's simple and not to track, you know, when, when somebody comes in, not to track where we were 20 years ago to where we are now. Um, yeah, but, but that's what we need to know for our purposes. Right. We need to yes. understand what is changing. And so I think that we've beat this horse to death. So I think, Anais, you understand what we need is yes. to be able to clearly track what's what's being changed in this parking table was difficult to figure out even for a numbers guru like uh, Commissioner Villamonte, of which I am not. So um, if Allison couldn't get it, then I know there's no hope for the rest of us. So, um, so yeah, let's try to get through your presentation because we are required to take a break at 1.30. Okay. So um, the parking reductions, which uh, follow the parking strategies or the parking ratios table, um, these are mostly a consolidation of parking reductions that were actually previously available in the code. There are a couple new ones. Um, so the uh, new ones include that up to 10% of parking may be converted to bicycle parking. Um, if you're located within a transit priority area, which is defined by public resources code, uh, then there are some parking reductions allowed. Um, shared parking, again, that was previously provided for. Uh, if you have a approved transportation demand management plan, uh, then there are some parking reductions allowed. And then the next three bullets there summarize uh, state law required reductions. Um, so due to historic resources, ADUs or accessory dwelling units, affordable housing, and then, um, sorry, not the next three, the next two. Um, and the last bullet point there um, shows a parking maximum. We actually had that in our existing code, um, was a little known requirement, um, but we do have a parking maximum to not allow more than 10% above the required parking. Uh, and then the new major section of the code is for bicycle parking, which um, we had very few standards for previously. Um, so we've completely rehauled this section. Uh, this includes uh, bicycle parking requirements as a percentage of vehicle parking requirements. This is modeled after the city of Santa Cruz bicycle parking code, which um, we got a lot of really positive feedback from bicycle advocates on. Um, and uh, some developers on. Um, there's also new design standards. We looked at a few design standards from around the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and then I worked with Public Works on those. Um, we also allow properties, as I mentioned previously, to convert vehicle parking into bicycle parking spaces. Uh, shower facilities are now required for new development or uh, what we call major enlargement, um, so not for existing facilities. Uh, and then vertical bicycle parking may be allowed with specific approval. And then we have some other major changes to the code. Um, so one of these I know has come up a lot here, which uh, is the exceptions to roadway standards. Um, so there is in the, um, the public works design criteria, there is a set of roadway standards that define the widths for vehicle lanes, sidewalks, and um, bicycle lanes. Uh, and within those roadway standards is actually an exception for the local roadway standard, which reduces the width. Um, and then the, there's an exception to that exception in our code, which allows people to um, not build that reduced roadway width, but actually um, get approval for something that ver that um, uh, is not that reduced roadway width, but something totally different um, based on a design that they get approval from the both the commission and the board of supervisors on. Um, and these exceptions can be based on a number of things. Sometimes they're environmental. Um, sometimes it's due to um, neighboring developments not having the same facilities built out. Um, there's, there is an exception for that in the code. And then, um, and some of the justifications have been because of the size of the roadway uh, facility available. Um, sometimes it's due to the parcel size. 
so what we did is we looked at a number of examples of where these exceptions had been approved. A lot of the developments that were getting exceptions to the roadway standards approved were minor land divisions. Uh, so very small roadway or very small um, projects uh, where the roadways were functionally a driveway. And um, so there's now in the code a proposed approach that allows for uh, what we call internal roadways and internal driveways. And these two types of facilities allow for a uh, different build out than what is in the, um, the design criteria currently. Um, they still provide for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So those two are still built in there. They still have to meet fire code requirements, um, but they can do that within a reduced footprint for the roadway. Um, the internal driveways are meant for four units or less. Internal roadways can be for a larger development where the roadway uh, is essentially, it's been offered to the county for dedication, but the county has denied it. Um, and it's not connecting to major, uh, or it's not connecting a publicly or county maintained roadway to another county maintained roadway. Um, so the idea is, is that the roadway is something that's probably maintained by an HOA or by the residents. Um, and it's a smaller one that's, um, functionally a local roadway. Um, and again, it would still have bicycle and pedestrian facilities uh, and the parking requirements would still be met, but um, we would allow for a reduced roadway within the code so that they wouldn't have to come for an exception and go through the whole design process vis-a-vis -vis that exception. Um, we also have a new set of standards for drive-through facilities, which we do allow for some drive-throughs. Um, and so we went and looked at other code examples or code examples from other cities. Um, the site distance is a new section in the code as well. That was previously just in the design criteria and, and sort of implemented through um, industry standard practice. And so now we've codified that. Uh, and then there were some changes to the surface lot design standards just to reduce the required aisle widths and um, bring that up to current practice. And so the next slide here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the um, Portola Drive street, skate, street scape concepts. Um, I know that some of you um, are familiar with this uh, project. This was incorporated into the EIR um, and sustainability update project. Uh, there's three, there's the existing conditions as you can see on the slide, there's a near-term concept and a long-term concept. The main difference between the near-term and the long-term concept is really the um, feasibility and cost. Um, so the near-term concept can be done without making changes to the curb line, um, whereas the long-term concept includes major changes to the curb line and the and landscaping. Uh, they both are a road diet, so they, as the term implies, a reduction in vehicle lanes, uh, where you go from four lanes to three lanes, where you have one lane each direction in the center turn lane. Um, they both have improved bicycle facilities and sidewalk facilities. The near-term concept focuses more on, um, because there's no changes to the curb, um, it focuses more on the uh, improving the side uh, the the sidewalk at crossings or intersections, um, as well as providing painted improvements for the bicycle facilities. Uh, whereas the long-term concept uh, actually can provide wider sidewalks and um, um, improved curb cuts. So uh, those are the major differences there. Um, and I think now I'm going to pass it back to Natisha to talk about the coastal access and placemaking um, and move on to parks. Sorry, on the east, before you continue on, can I ask you sure. a, a question about that and about the Portola specifically? Sure. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about the near term and the short term. Is that, is that, I just want to clarify, is that you were talking about the one lane in each direction with the internal turn lane? Is, is that still? the plan for that, that area given 
These are all, you know, I should have said this, this, this is all plan level. So um, these concepts that you're seeing are considered um, design concepts. They would need to go through um, uh, design engineering and um, if, if or when they were gonna be implemented in the long term, there's no funding identified for these projects. Um, the, I know that there's a lot of, of uh, community feedback on these concepts. Um, another, we recently uh, released the active transportation plan for the county and um, that came up as one of the comments or questions on the active transportation plan. And for that, they've identified improved protected facilities on this corridor, but um, it doesn't necessarily preclude or um, incorporate a road diet. Um, so that's sort of a long, a long winded answer for saying, uh, we don't know uh, what will happen on Portola Drive. Um, the EIR will cover a road diet if that's the direction we go, but we do need further engineering studies. Um, we also do know, and this is called out in the, um, the uh, list, it's Appendix J of uh, improvements for intersections and roadways. Uh, we do know that there are intersection improvements needed in this area, uh, both for operations and safety. So uh, we did look at that as, as um, part of the background information for the EIR, as well as just the general planning and identified some basic level improvements for the intersections. So that specific, those specific improvements are included in the general plan uh, update or sustainability update, but the, the road diet itself is very conceptual. It would, it would need to go through a lot of work before it became real. I just, hi everybody, Stephanie Sorry, Hansen. Stephanie. I just wanted to add a little bit to that, but um, after the pleasure point um, plan was accepted by the board in 2018, the direction was to study these concepts in the EIR, um, which, which has been done. There are some recommendations for where um, uh, intersection improvements are necessary to accommodate the um, concepts here. Um, we recognize there was, um, there was a pop-up project this summer that um, had some execution issues and didn't go as well as a lot of community feedback um, um, about the concepts. Um, so the, the general plan um, policies and implementation strategies in the access and mobility element have a some general language about about this concept, which is to um, um, study it further um, and determine what improvements are you know are uh, good for development, seek funding, and so forth. Um, I just want uh, I didn't want the commission to be under the impression that you, you know these are the improvements that that we're making. Um, there's a reason why it was studied in the EIR. And then there's general language now as a policy and implementation strategy regarding it. Um, it's not necessarily something that's going to appear on the uh, capital improvement uh, program next next year or anything like that. So just to add a little bit. Yeah, thank you for that. Since this came up, now I'm confused because on page nine of the staff report, you identify the proposed uh, general plan. Um, the the implementation strategy um, that actually does seem quite specific. If there's a new development, it says clearly require new development to build plan lines for the Santa Cruz County SBCC, which which is the this plan. So I'm a little confused now. Um, the plan line has to be developed. Right, what, but what so I there's a lot of work that, that goes is, into that. This is just a study, this isn't, this is general, but actually, no, it seems like if you are building a new building, you actually will have to make improvements consistent with this policy, if should this policy be adopted. Right, uh, with, with the plan line. Uh, a plan right. line, yeah, so I mean, a plan line is, is a, simply a plan for improvements that could be made. Um, we 
wouldn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that those improvements get built. We actually have a lot of plan lines that are not getting built right now in the county. And one of the major projects that we identified with Public Works is to update a number of those plan lines to be consistent with the ATP. Um, so, it's, but it's the first necessary step to identifying whether or not the improvements that have been I looked at at a conceptual level will, will work at an engineering level. Well, and it seems a little premature given, um, you know, the, the pop-up project last year yielded kind of questionable results. Yeah, I think that the pop-up project yielded questionable results for a number of reasons. One was that the intersection improvements weren't implemented alongside with it. Well, we don't need to so, go into the specifics of that right now. I'm just, I think that this section needs to be um, clarified and, and um, I, yes, I'm frankly a little confused by it right now. So um, I'll, I'll let you finish the presentation because I know we're almost up to 1.30 and we can talk about it after the break. Yeah, I'd like to circle back to this though as well because I'd like to know how much we are specifically adopting. If you, I mean, part of your presentation included the existing conditions, the near-term con concept and the long-term concept. And I, 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 I would like to circle back with this as well as how much we are uh, endorsing, codifying, approving a particular, I mean, in, in, in um, like she said, AM 2.1i, it says the pleasure point commercial corridor, the whole street, street shape concept and pleasure point guiding principle parts. And I'd like to know how much we're, how specific that is, um, and then encouraging or requiring even development plan lines to, 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 to go that direction. And so I, I, I would also like to circle back on this when we, we have a chance, so thank you. I think I'm going to pass this off to Natisha then to talk about uh, coastal access and placemaking. Um, thanks, Ani. So um, one of the <clears throat> um, major changes that's uh, happening for uh, General Plan Chapter 7 is that a lot of the coastal access policies used to exist in that um, Chapter 7 parks, public works, and um, sorry, parks, uh, recreation, and public facilities chapter. Um, and a, a significant portion of those have been uh, moved to the new chapter three access and mobility chapter. Um, so uh, they, I think I will pass this back to Anis to kind of discuss that more access um, portion of the coastal access and placemaking policies. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit, touch a little bit later on coastal access as it's included in chapter seven. Could I just ask what you mean by placemaking? Sure. Um, so or wayfinding. Yeah. Um, so placemaking is generally a, a concept or a term used to uh, refer to the community creating a sense of identity uh, within the public realm. So it's um, in the roadway, it's often done by, sometimes you'll see it with murals on the street or um, uh, in general art in the street. Um, sometimes it's done through signage uh, and sign it. When we say wayfinding, we really mean signage that directs people mm -hmm. to a particular set of key destinations. Um, no, I, um, I, I think that really, I don't want to take up your time, but a lot of these terms, which I guess are planners um, terminology, are not accessible to most members of the public. So once again, as I did with make the same suggestion I made before, when you have these terms that are specific to your area of expertise, could you make a definition page? Because I, I wouldn't have any idea what those terms mean, and yet they're very, very important. Maybe there could just be a definitions when you're using terms that need to be explained to the general public. Yeah, and I think it's a good idea to have call outs like that in the general plan as well. Because it's um, getting more technical and more jargony. I understood the old titles. These are good and they're more inclusive, but they're obscure. I know when you get used to using them, they're clear to you, but they, they are not going to feel very accessible. And you can explain them pretty pretty well in a short paragraph and give them give them the context they need. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, so just to get to um, 
Natisha's okay, request. So, so, so I got placemaking. What's wayfinding? Do you, if you need uh, signage, why not just say signage? Because it's a specific type of signage that directs people to a set of key destinations identified by the. Uh, it's often for tourists or people who are well, new to the good. area. You just, you just made a very clear explanation in one sentence that I could look up now. Okay. So um, the coastal access section, as Natisha was saying, or the coastal access policies, as Natisha was saying, um, a lot of them were moved from the parks and uh, recreation element relating to specifically to uh, po points of access uh, that are um, places that people can access the, the coast from our roadway system. So that was the thinking behind it is that um, they're related to how people move um, and how people need to get there. So we, we moved a lot of those policies over to access and mobility. If they were specifically related to trails or maintenance, because the maintenance of coastal access is done by the Parks and Recreation Department, um, we left them in the um, in the Parks and Public Facilities uh, element. Um, so you'll still see some there, or if they're trail specific, then we left them there. Uh, but in general, the majority of them were moved over to the coastal access element, or excuse me, to the access mobility element. Uh, also, we had a major update to the local coastal plan guidelines uh, between 1994 and um, the and now. So we had to create a lot of new policies to um, to be in compliance with those LCP guidelines. Uh, most of them are about maintaining coastal access, improving coastal access, and creating new coastal access. Um, so not surprising policies out of left field, but just supporting that, that um, recreation. What you're saying is anything having to do with trails and the coasts are separate now. So if um, we had a trails plan, would it include coastal access or would it not? That would be up to the Parks Department, but it certainly could. Um, trails are generally within the way we, we sort of made a fuzzy separation is that trails are generally within parks um and um, used for recreation whereas the um, uh, facilities that are discussed in the access mobility element uh, are they can be separated meaning not in the roadway um, but they're uh, all inclusive so not just recreation but often used for commuters or um, access to destinations for daily purposes Okay, what about the tremendous number of places where we have public easements? Um, what, sorry, is what's that the a, question? Is, that a, is, there, is a trail a public easement? Uh, it could, a public easement could be part of a trail. All right, well, I'm not gonna, I think that's a very narrow definition, but go, go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure I understand the question, but there is there are policies related to easements. Um, in I believe both the, the access and mobility element as well as the uh, um, parks, recreation, and public facilities element. Okay, real briefly, there is a, a large plan which has been around a long time that to connect the parks with trails, which involves public easement. So you could get from one park to the other. It's a state park uh, uh, too. And I don't know where that would fall in this. That would be a parks master plan, which is out of scope with this. But there, the trails that would connect parks would not be park trails. They would be public easements. That would be included in a parks master plan, which is out of scope with this. Okay. So I'll pass this back to Natisha now. Um, and so I just oh. want to let you guys know that we have to take a break at 1.30. So if you could wrap up the staff presentation by then, that would be great. Yeah, so um, we had originally proposed to allow the commission to sort of have a focused discussion on transportation at this point, but um, it sounds like you'd prefer to kind of continue on and just finish the presentation. Well, that because I think we do, I think the commissioners probably do all have a lot to say. I know that I have some comments, but we're mandated to take the break at 1.30 and then we need to take public comment and then we'll have um, questions for and comments for staff, I'm sure. 
Natisha, is this a good point to take a break then? If it, I mean, I don't know how much longer your presentation would go on. We have about uh, four more slides. Okay, um, let's get through those four slides. And then I want to apologize to the public that we're going to have to take a break until two o'clock. And then at two o'clock, we will hear from the public. Okay. So community services are critical to both high quality neighborhoods and commercial vitality. And chapter seven of the general plan, the parks, recreation and public facilities element, <coughs> excuse me, addresses topics related to community services as well as community facilities to support existing and future populations in a manner that's consistent with sustainable growth patterns. More specifically, chapter seven includes policies on parks, recreational and cultural facilities public facilities, public services, and utility infrastructure. The sustainability update pro uh, project proposes a partial update of chapter seven. Um, so it addresses this, the new element addresses the same topics as the existing element and incorporates some updates to a chapter that hasn't been substantially changed since its adoption in 1994. Um, so it's now consistent with new state laws, <coughs> pardon me, um, with new local plans and industry practices. But uh, most of the changes that you see in the chapter simply streamline, consolidate, and reorganize existing policies. I had a question on tape in that section of transportation, parks, and public facilities. There's a table called 3.9 that has stuff like live animal keeping regulation and uh, regulations for fences and stuff. What's that doing in parks? public features and transportation. And I thought we were going to discuss that kind of thing separately. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what table you're referencing. Can you clarify? Yeah, it's on page 34 of the staff report, table 3.3-9, summary of Santa Cruz County Code Amendments. But it's in this, it's under this general section of transportation, parks, and public facilities draft EIR description. Okay, so it's in, is it included in the attachment, the project uh, description from the EIR? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah that's, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Renee, that's just a summary of all of the code amendments. It's It hasn't been edited down this particular table. Um, so we're not talking about any of those specifics now. No, we, we'll get to those on the 13th. Okay, so... Yeah. All right, I'm trying to follow you along in my staff report, so yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so first, we're going to talk a little bit about public facilities. Okay. Um, so the public facility institutional land use designation was previously included in Chapter 2 of the general plan, the formal land use element. Um, and it was moved to Chapter 7 in this update in order to consolidate public facility policies in one location. The P designation characterizes lands used for a variety of public serving uses, including schools, fire stations, government buildings, water supply and treatment facilities, as well as privately owned facilities built and maintained for public purposes, such as churches, hospitals, and landfills. Um, and the designation was updated to establish standards for maximum building intensity as required by state law. So this sets a maximum building height consistent with the standards in the implementing public facility zone district as well as a new maximum lot coverage range of 40 to 95%, which accommodates the variety of public and quasi-public serving uses that are appropriate on P-designated lands. The P-designation is also intended for appropriate ancillary public facility activities, and this includes residential uses. Um, and this update retains existing policies that permit residential development, including 100% affordable multifamily housing on P-designated land, as well as school employee housing on school owned properties. And the um, changes that you uh, can see in this section simply reflect the density increases that were proposed uh, for urban residential designations in the built environment element that we discussed and reviewed at the last study session on June 8th. In the county code, the proposed changes to the uh, PF or public facility district incorporate um, new development standards that are consistent with commercial zone districts including um, increasing the height maximum from 35 to 40 feet, as well as new standards for medical mixed use, which we also reviewed in detail at the last uh, study session, um, but the standards are provided here as well on this slide. Um, so 
Um, some of the um, most significant changes um, are, are pretty much focused on consolidating and streamlining and updating the, um, the chapter. As we noted earlier, um, it's really a partial update. Um, and so some, some of the changes that you'll see in this section combine some related public service uh, sections that used to be separate. Um, those are listed here, school care facilities, fire and public uh, police protection were combined, and the three separate sanitation facilities sections were combined into one section in this update. Other sections of this chapter that include more substantive changes um, updated for consistency with current plans and best practices, particularly related to the utilities and infrastructure sections. Um, and this includes policies related to water supply and stormwater. Um, in the county, local water districts and groundwater management agencies are responsible for planning for the water supply in our area, while the county plays a more important role in protecting the quality of the water supply and in requiring users to conserve water. Um, however, there was a new strategy added to the general plan to support groundwater sustainability and, and bring the general plan into consistency with the 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And another key change in the general plan related to water is um, that uh, policies were updated to be consistent with low impact design strategies that are already um, required in the existing county design criteria. And that includes, um, you know, bioswales, permeable services. Um, and this update simply requires new development to maintain the capacity of the site's stormwater retention, as well as recharge uh, groundwater resources um, consistent with the design criteria. So. Um, we'll discuss some of these water policies in more detail at our uh, next study session on July 13th, which will focus on natural resources and um, additional uh, water policies included in Chapter 5 of the General Plan. Um, chapter 7 also includes new, uh, new policy based on the County Climate Action Strategy regarding wastewater reclamation and energy conservation. Um, there's also some updates related to the integrated waste management section, which makes it consistent with new state waste reduction laws. And the chapter also includes a new telecommunications and broadband objective, which includes a new forward looking policies that um, really lay the groundwork for expanding broadband access to underserved areas of the county in according with environmental justice goals. Am I just letting you know we're at 1.30, so um, is this your final slide? This is the final slide, and then we have the recommended actions. So I can okay, kind so of let's move through it quickly. We need to respect the UTV folks. Thanks. Yep. Um, so to talk, uh, to talk a little bit about parks policies in this element, um, uh, addressing land use related to recreation, set standards for parks, and address the provision of adequate park facilities in our communities. The revised element really retains and consolidates and updates those objectives and policies related to parks and recreation. Um, so that includes um, the, that the designation was updated to establish new development limitations as required by state law, including the new maximum building height, um, which is consistent with the implementing zone districts of uh, parks and recreation and open space and the timber production district. Um, it also includes a maximum lot coverage of zero to 40%, which accommodates the existing range of building intensity allowed on ORR designated land, which can range from you know, the um, out space, uh, open space for active recreational uses, such as neighborhood parks and recreational facilities like the Simpkins Swim Center, to more uh, low intensity passive uses um, to preserve the scenic values of open space lands. And uh, the changes to the parks planning are, are not really proposed except to reflect any projects that have already been completed and to align with the county park strategic plan, which was completed in 2018 by the county parks department and developed in collaboration with the local community, um, this plan sets out the vision and strategic priorities for the county's park system for the next 10 years. Um, in chapter seven, there is a new goal created based on the strategic plan, the goal 2.0, opportunities for all, to provide opportunities for people of all ages, incomes and uh, groups and abilities to recreate in active spaces and enjoy passive natural open spaces. Um, as Anya's already mentioned, some of the coastal policies were retained in this chapter specifically related to recreation at the beach and maintenance of coastal access because those are closely tied to the concepts of parks and public facilities. And that's also closely related to, as we discussed earlier, the trails and recreation corridors section, uh, which is included in chapter seven. Um, this section largely remains the same as the existing general plan with more of a focus on recreation that works in conjunctions with 
trail access policies included in chapter three of uh, the access and mobility element. And it also provides strengthened support for the development of a future regional trails master plan that would link county park facilities and implement the um, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail and California Coastal Trail. So um, looking ahead, we have another study session scheduled with the Planning Commission uh, this uh, for July 13th to review code modernization, agriculture and resources, as well as a review of the EIR. And following these study sessions, we'll return to the Planning Commission in August for public hearings. Um, with that, we'll end the presentation today with a recommended action, which is to conduct a study session on the sustainability update focused on the access and mobility element the parks, recreation, public and facilities element and amendments to the county code. Um, and we also just wanted to confirm whether the commission would like to hold another study session for further discussion and um, for the commission to provide additional comments and any proposed changes um, that we might want to uh, discuss before the public hearings begin. Um, otherwise, that concludes our presentation and we're happy to answer questions. I know we'll be taking a break here, but I wanted to add that Annie Murphy and Stephanie Hansen, who are involved in this project, um, will also be available to answer any questions and should be elevated to be able to answer any questions that the Commission has. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I want to let the any folks, I understand there's a number of people waiting to speak um, on this item, so I just want to apologize that we are required to take a break now to give our community TV folks who um, do such an awesome job holding these remote public hearings for us so they can take a break. And so we will return at five minutes after two to um, continue the meeting and we will hear directly from the public at that time. Thank you so much for, uh, for your patience and understanding. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is now 2.05 and we are back. I just want to apologize um, if I, there was anything that I was saying during the break. I did not realize that I was unmuted um, and I hope I, there was no offense caused by anything that was, uh, was discussed. No problem at all. Um, so let's go directly to uh, the public. We can, do you, can you tell how many folks would like to speak to us this afternoon? Uh, right now I have one hand raised. That is Patricia B Brady. Uh, good afternoon, Patty. Uh, could you please unmute yourself and speak for the record? Yes, thank you very much for the time. I really want to send my appreciation to the commissioners for the level of detail you're really taking on this issue. This plan has been in process for six years and basically over 12 days, you and we, the public, are being asked to accept it. I, I'm really here for another agenda item, which is the density, but I'm going to have to leave. But I would like to speak to the fact that, as one commissioner commented, there are different needs throughout the county regarding parking, um, transportation, um, and even road modifications. And this is, does not seem to be the concept that's being presented here. And Pleasure Point is one of those that even yesterday as I was coming back from the airport, the driver said, wow, there is so much traffic and there's no parking. So this is a known issue to people. Um, we in our position paper, which you have all received, ask for the county's plan to be realistic, flexible, and balanced. 
And we would really appreciate if the drawing table would make these considerations rather than theoretical what ifs, because the reality is, is different than what is on paper here. Also, um, <clears throat> let's see, what else? Well, again, I'd just like to express my appreciation to the commissioners for the level of detail that you're inhaling on this very, very important issue. Our legacy as those that are speaking out and yours, you know, depend on how this plan plays out. And what's what happened in the past doesn't matter for 2022. Our realities are very different and that's what we should be looking at. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Lizanne, or uh, is there anybody else? Um, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. Oh, Celeste has just raised her hand. Good afternoon, Celeste. Would you please unmute yourself? Hello. Good afternoon, Celeste. Hi. Um, I I'm sorry. I just missed the last speaker. I hope I'm not repeating anything. Um, I I wanted to sp speak about. Um, the rezoning of the corner of Thurber and Soquel Drive. And um, it was existing as office commercial, neighborhood commercial and urban open space. And the proposed change is to urban residential, high flexible, high density flexible use and community commercial. And I wanted to ask that it not be light industrial. I feel like the corridor that that exists on has plenty of that type of business adjacent to it. And it doesn't really respect um, the residential neighborhoods that abut that area, like Santa Cruz Gardens, the residents um, behind Dominican Hospital and also that Thurber is a single lane, mostly in and out to at least Santa Cruz Gardens. And so I just feel like there's enough of that type of business already. And there's also all the high density housing um, that you can imagine in that corridor from Mission to Howe along Soquel Drive. So we have all of that and it seems like a really strategic lot where it could be a lovely um, community plaza similar to the Swift Street Plaza for the residents that are, I feel, largely ignored. It's always thought that Soquel Drive is just businesses and it's not. There's tons of residents that could benefit that wouldn't have to drive elsewhere to receive those types of um, benefits from that uh, a plaza, a community plaza type of thing. Thank you. Oh, I was watching, hello. Okay, I, I don't see any additional hands raised at this time. Uh, okay. Um, I knew some folks were there um, earlier in the morning, but it looks like they probably dropped off. So if you do one last check and see no one else, I will then close the public hearing. Uh, there's nobody else who has their hand raised at this time, um, but I will just remind everybody if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand by hitting the hand icon, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. If you uh, move your mouse, your cursor down there, uh, and if you're speaking, if you're speaking by telephone, joining us by telephone, please um, press star nine. And we do have one additional person who now raised their hand, Alex Vartan. Alex, good afternoon. Please uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes, I we can hear. I just want to add. Sure. Thank you. Um, for some reason, I got the uh, hours on this meeting wrong, and I I wasn't able to attend the earlier uh, part of this meeting, but. Um, and I don't know if it was discussed or mentioned. I just do want to mention that in my read of um, the plan and the code updates, I did um, uh, find uh, 
missing um, some discussion, or again, maybe it's not quite right for the planning department, but um, I think with a lot of parking technology changing very rapidly um, with stacked parking and robot parking, um, that really dramatically changes the economics of uh, a lot of the, say, the fixed cost of doing underground parking if you can now uh, amortize that over um, a much uh, you know, um, larger volume of parking if you can do stacked parking like that. And I was somewhat surprised, again, it was really not um, germane to the analysis, uh, but that if we're going to really think about this plan um, for long term, I, I was, was really hoping we uh, take more thought uh, if it's possible or maybe look at what other communities have done. Um, if they have thought about how communities for emerging uh, parking technologies can be, um, you know, considered as we're as we're rewriting the code, and I guess the um, you know the corollary. Alex, we can no longer hear you. You seem to have lost connection. Can you hear us? It's, uh, it seems that we've we've lost Alex at this at this point. I could hear he was breaking up. Alex, we do apologize for that. Sorry, um, can you hear me? You're back. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I don't know where you lost me, but I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I think it would be great if we can figure out a way to encourage underground parking uh, a little more, and um, you know, think about that in the code. Uh, you know, uh, however possible to uh, uh, allow for some of the, the more um, uh, emerging technologies that are going to be able to increase the density we get um, with stack parking, et cetera. So it'd be great to see some, um, you know, consideration of how can we get more parking actual underground. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? If so, please uh, raise your hand by hitting the hand icon at the bottom of your screen or star nine if you're calling in by telephone. I'm uh, not seeing any additional hands raised. Okay. Um, so then we will close the public hearing component of this item and bring it back to the commission. There is no uh, action really needed for this except to um, ask questions, uh, comments. Um, so is there a commissioner that would like to start us off? I will be glad to. Thank you. My comments, I'm just gonna go through the document where I had comments or questions and by the page number. So my first question is on page 10, which I think I already referred to, which is, I'd like to see an example when we come back to look at this of the LOS and EMT applied standards, um, VMT um, standards applied to a specific project or street improvement or something. So I can understand how you're evaluating traffic in a very specific way. Because of necessity, when you explain it, it's very general and I don't really get a sense of it. So I'd like to see some examples. So I understand what the change means. Um, and then on page 11, um, in the second paragraph above the chart, um, board directed staff to make additional changes to the TDM approach. The first change was incorporating an incentive in the SCCC that reduces parking requirements. Uh, to people um, within the urban services line and with a half mile of public transit stops with the bus pass provision. And then you go into, and of course there is a great deal of explanation of that in the back, um, farther, that, farther back in the uh, document uh, where you give a sample of what such a, um, such a uh, contract with the developer could look like. Um, is there any, aside from this one project in which you have given bus passes out, have, do you have any sense of if other jurisdictions have tried that? It's 
So there are state laws that allow for parking reductions or exceptions if you're within a half mile of high, of high quality transit. Um, there's also some cities that allow for those same reductions that go beyond what the state laws allow for. Um, I don't know of specific developments that are comparable to the types of developments that we see here in Santa Cruz. Um, so I'd have to do a little digging to find something that would um, satisfy your question, um, propose that to you. Um, so the, this is um so okay that that's fine the, and you're the, only proposing it in the, within the urban services line correct right um and high quality transit is something is a very specific definition in the public resources code at this point in time we don't actually have any in the unincorporated county high quality transit has to meet um it has to be 15 minute headways at a stop satisfied by more than one bus route. Uh, and the way that Metro or Transit District plans bus routes means that we don't actually have a bus stop that meets that definition currently in the county. In the county period? In the, in the unincorporated county. I believe yeah. there are a couple in the city of Santa Cruz, but not in the unincorporated county. Well, I just find this a pro I think I can understand why you're proposing it. It might be worth doing, but to use it as a way of getting people to drive less, I'm not so sure. What about people have to take kids to school? Most people drive their kids to school, and you're suggesting that they were trying to get them to take a bus with their kids to both come home and then go to work themselves. And most people drop their kids off, and someone picks them up coming or going from work. What about senior citizens for which a half mile is a long walk and what about if we ever get a winter again? I just don't, I can understand why we want to encourage it and it's maybe a great proposal, but to say it's gonna cut down on people using cars, I, I don't know if that will attain that goal. Um, and those were are just a couple examples. I know that um, when I looked at the public comments, which I looked at a lot, the biggest objections, the people that people are the most trouble to were um, this idea of, you know, trying to reduce driving by coming up with prohibited ways that make it harder to drive, and I'm just not sure if that's going to really result in the, in the in what you want to happen. I I think so. So I'm not sure if that do you really think that's going to work. I I don't think having a bus pass for a lot of people here. It's true that a lot of people are uh, low income people will may use them, but other people will just think, well, that's nice, but I'm going to get in my car. The, Especially if you got to drive kids or you have doctor's appointments or, or whatever. Is it is it realistic to think this makes people drive less? And then then, you know, the other thing is I think it's fairly unenforceable if you're going to people are going to sell their bus passes, give them away forget them. I mean, it's just to administer, it's going to be a nightmare. And I don't see developers wanting to do it because you're putting the burden on them. Large projects have a lot of turnover. I mean, I can think of, and I won't go into them here, lots of reasons. I don't think it's a measure that's going to necessarily get people out of their cars. And I don't think it should, I think it's a great idea, but I don't think it's a strategy that has many legs. So the bus pass program, along with a lot of other TDM measures, is an incentive. It's it's a carrot, not a stick. It doesn't force people to get out of their cars. It doesn't require them to do that. They can still drive their kids to school in a vehicle should they choose to. Um, it's uh, an incentive that, if not provided, isn't going to change anything. If it is provided, it is one more way that people can change their behavior. So by not providing it, we're not changing the status quo. By providing it, we're at least providing some kind of incentive to do something different. Um, it does have to be in, I, provided. I, I, I think we're agreeing with each other. As an incentive, it's a good program. To put it, to purport that it is going to get people out of their cars, I think is a misnomer. I just want to say that. I just don't think it fits in a way to get people to stop driving. But I think it's a great incentive and something worth considering if it could really be administered and forced in a, in, a, in a way that makes economic sense. And if developers are willing to become administrators of parking permits, which I doubt, but that's what you're proposing. 
Well, we're not proposing developers become administrative managed parking permits. In the uh, bus program, bus parking, excuse me, bus uh, pass program, it would, if it was a residential program or residential development, the passes would be administered by an HOA. Um, if it was a employer-based type development, then it would be managed by uh, a transportation coordinator. Um, the developer, as we all know, once the, the project is developed is no longer in the picture. Well, so, I agree with you that I think for employers, it has makes some sense. If you've ever belonged to an HOA, it's a volunteer organization. Sometimes you have people getting a hard time getting people to even join it. And if you're going to give them administrative duties, what they'll need to do anyway. I've, I dwelled on that long enough. I want to come back to page 13, which is the big change which is reducing the number of parking spaces. So if you build a one bedroom home, you're gonna require one parking space, which means that people are gonna to have to use their garage to park their car because there is, in Santa Cruz, it's unlikely that there is one person living in a one bedroom. It's more likely that there's at least two people and if it's students, maybe five or six. So how does, I just don't know that it has any legs and in reading the comments that, there was uniformly, if you look at pages like 95 to 103, when people were talking about what they want, it wasn't less parking. So I, I just don't know if it really um, makes any sense. And it, it, I, I also want to say in, in the rural area, everybody needs a car because there's no other way to get around. So if you have a house or two or three bedroom house, there's going to be teenage kids, there may be seniors, there may, you know, the idea that everyone's going to, I just don't see, I don't think it's, it's realistic. So, and, and of all your feedback, there wasn't any, there were vast majorities of people who didn't think it was a good idea. So I, I can't, couldn't, I don't see how it's really going to be effective. And if we have tiny homes and they're going to pike park in driveways, then no one's going to get out of anywhere. So I don't know, but I mean, Two spaces means you, most people use their garage as kind of a storage place and they have games there and equipment and so on. So you're going to change the way people live because everyone, most families that have, you know, two or three kids, they get older, they have a car, their grandparents live with them, or two people work in different places. How do you see that working um, for what, the way people, most people live here? Uh, so the parking space reduction for residential uh, units is based on fairly common standards uh, you, that are used at other jurisdictions. Like, um, example, we are seeing Santa Clara, San Jose, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Monterey in Monterey County. Um, so we are also seeing that the state is now um, through legislation requiring a reduction in parking spaces for um, residential builds. If somebody were to build a new single family home, um, they could choose to build a two car garage um, for a one bedroom if they wanted to, we're requiring one space. Um, so- That's a parking space that's not a garage, right? Just to make sure that I really am understanding that. Your garage right. doesn't so off, a off street parking. Um, so the, you know, the code is a minimum right now. Um, some codes in some cities use parking maximums. Um, we have a parking minimum and uh, we do have a parking cap maximum, which is no more than 10%. Um, so that would have to be, you know, acknowledged, but, um, and addressed, but, I, you know, it's for a one bedroom home, if you have a garage and a driveway, then you've got two spaces in tandem. Well, then maybe I'm not understanding. What do you mean by parking space then? Uh, you parking don't mean the driveway. Is that what you're saying? A parking space is any space that's off street. So a parking space would be your driveway. Sure, or a garage. So if you have a garage, you can have you can park one vehicle in a garage and one vehicle in a driveway. Okay. 
but I don't see any responses to the feedback we got. There, there was this was the most strongly opposed by all the people who commented, but I don't see any response. We are still collecting in the process of collecting um, comments, and um, I don't know that we're going to prepare individual responses to every comment that we receive. Um, but we are just now starting to update the uh, the draft documents that were released. So um, and this is part of that process. We needed to collect input from the Planning Commission before we started making changes. Well, I was referring not only to the individual comments, but when you did the surveys, uh, looking at the yeses and nos of what I would like to see and what changes I think are okay. It was startling how many people opposed the decision to limit parking. I just know when I look at the denser developments in Santa Cruz and up here in Scotts Valley too, uh, everybody's got it, gets a garage, they fill it full of stuff, and then they park their they park their cars in their driveway. I, I think this is a big change. Okay, I just think you need to respond to the fact that that is the single uh, issue. It's a big change that you got the most negative response to. Um, you have other comments, Commissioner Shepard? Uh, yes, I just need to um, turn my pages to them. Um, in addressing water, which I guess we'll talk about a lot more in the other study session, um, you didn't go into much detail about the fact that the districts have planned projects to address water availability and new development must secure. I mean, I think it kind of glossed over that because it's not your responsibility to provide water, right? That was right. very unfleshed out. We, um, we do have some policies that address water quality as it enters the supply, so low impact development policies, um, but we are not water suppliers, so we don't address that aspect of water management. We have one policy that um, that's a, or it might be as an implementation strategy to be in compliance with um, with management plans. Um, but in general, our strategies are more around managing the water as it enters into the groundwater supply. There are also existing policies on requiring letters of water availability from the supplier before uh, permits are issued for a project. And, and those um, entities are part of the review team that looks at any project as well. So without that, they couldn't get a building permit. That That's not new, That that's the case now. Okay, on uh, page 33, um, on section 1310-2020-2080, you mentioned the proposed amendments were mod mod modernization amendments to, per permit to permit application process and procedure, changes use approval to use permit separate from site development permit, redefine site development permit as separate from use permit. What does that mean? Um, we'll go over this in depth at the next um, study right. session. Um, no, but no problem, we can just skip it then. There, there were a lot of those changes I didn't quite get, and I assume that that would also apply to uh, changes in 13.10, um, the 20s and 30s, right? 20s and 30s. All the, all the items on page 34 and 35. Some of these are related to the parking standards that we have looked at. Okay, um, well, um, I don't think anything on page 34 is wrong, right? Uh, 34 does have the parking standards. This, this table is meant to kind of help um, anybody trying to get familiar with the project understand what sections of code are changing for the project as a whole. So, well, specifically then, there's regulations concerning fences and retaining walls. Is that going to be discussed on the 13th? Yes, we can discuss that on the 13th. Of, yeah, highlighting what's interesting to the commission um, 
and what we th we think the major changes are. And if that's one of them that the commission wants to particularly review, we can make sure we cover that. Well, I would I would like to review the mining districts, the uh, the agriculture preserve and farmland security combining district, the regulations for fences and retaining walls, the outdoor storage of personal property and materials, and the uh, animal regulations specifically. And then on page 35, the last, very last Title 16 environmental and resource protection um, design standards for rural private roads and driveways has moved to parking and circulation, as has updates and clarifies ag and land preservation standards. Is that something we will talk about then as well? Yes, there's an access question in there, Anais. Um, and this so is the beginning, so I'm not sure if we made that I'd just clear like to know what, what has, what it is now and what the proposed changes are for those two sections as well. The, um, the first part of that question I can answer, which is just to say that the requirements for access and circulation um, have moved and were consolidated into 13, a new chapter 1316. 1316 is about parking and circulation. So if there's something in particular of concern yeah, what, there. How, how have the design standards for rural private roads and driveways changed? They were moved into 1316. But that's, we haven't changed them, we just moved them? We moved them. There is some strike through underline listed out in them. I think we actually made uh, the so the driveway standards, even though they were called rural driveway standards, some of those standards were applicable to all driveways. So um, we made that section more comprehensive to address standards for all driveways. All driveways, whether they're in the urban or rural services. Area. Right. Right. You don't and think. So there should be Section, different standards for places that are in large parkers in rural areas? There are still different standards that I don't have the section memorized, but there is strike through and underline for the exact areas where code was changed. Okay, and then moving up, and I'm, I haven't got many more, but on page 53, um, I'm bringing this up again, where I think it says that third paragraph, the first complete paragraph on page 53 is breaking this cycle. And then there's a small paragraph under it, which says this ordinance, which is about, again, bus passage, will incentivize the construction of low car housing, allowing projects to greatly utilize reduced parking requirements in exchange for consistent Metro funding. I think, you know, having Underground parking, shared parking, those are policies that can achieve some of those goals and they're doable. But I don't support um, allowing developers to have much less cars getting in exchange for bus passes. I just don't think it really works or makes sense. So I just want to say that. Um, and I, I would need to see how it's going to reduce, how it's really going to work and if it would really work. I think there are those other policies, just like that um, person who got cut off, his phone didn't work very well before. Let's work on reducing parking by policies and um, recommendations that we can actually achieve and that are doable. So I, I think, <clears throat> sorry, so the, I'm just pointing out to you that this is looked at here in this section that I just read you on page 53. It looks like you're going to, the impetus is to make that into an imp, a policy that achieves that goal. And I don't think that that makes much sense or that it will work. Whereas the others are doable and I think they'll work. And again, I'm only bringing it out uh, because I'm looking at the, the large percentage of what feedback you had and the surveys you did and what people have said, which is mostly more about parking than any other thing. Um, um. Okay, then I've only got one more. Okay. And, and I am I'm just saying I'm I'm referring to some of if you want to see what I'm talking about, look at the surveys on page 92 
1994 up to 100. Okay, those were my specifics. I have to say, um, it is really useful to get on role as planning commissions, which looks at code to see what changes are made to all these code sections. I, I understand that when you give us a general overview, that's helpful, but we're gonna deal with people who are actually needing to know what the code says and they have problem, they wanna know what it means. So I would like to see in the upcoming study, study session, what codes are changing um, with, with great consistency because that's what we live with is what the codes are, not what the policy is. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Those were all excellent comments and I wrote down some of the follow-up items that I can summarize at the conclusion of our comments. Um, so is there another commissioner who's ready with their comments? Yes, Commissioner Sheridan, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so in the... Um, recreational part of where you say parks recreation there's a section there that you originally referred to it as park recreation and open space but then as you went down the column it became parks and recreation i don't know what page that's on but i i think it's important to be consistent and to include open space in all the sections that refer to parks, recreation, and open space, because I think they're all supposed to be under one title. Is that? I'm not sure I'm following the comment. Are you able to be more specific? <laughs> so my understanding of parks is that parks is referred to as parks, recreation, and open space. That's their official title. They're not referred to as parks and recreation. So at one point it was referred to as parks, recreation, and open space, and then later in the column it said parks and recreation. And I think that could be that can be extremely confusing, um, especially for somebody like myself who has had a lot of interaction with parks, recreation, and open space. So I think the title is really important to make sure that's included. You're, you're talking about the title of the department of the sections that all the sections should include. It's the department is not referred to as parks and recreation. It's refer to as parks, recreation, and open space. Okay, their actual title is even longer than, than that for the department. Is it? <laughs> Cultural <laughs> resources too. Oh yeah, they have, oh, that's true. And then another comment I had about this is um, at some point you mentioned the um, trying to create a, a trail that was consistent through our county to connect trails and to connect transportation trails. And um, I can't be specific because I wasn't taking copious notes, but um, there's a little bit of a slippery slope when you start putting um, open space, passive trails that then become uh, transportation um, avenues. And I think it's important to um, have delineations when a trail is part of an open space that there needs to be some sort of um, caveat when you begin to create transportation on an open space corridor. So I, I don't know how to address that, but I um, just being somebody that is highly conscious of open space and, and passive recreation, I can see how those kind of trails could could easily open up to transportation and yet there at the same time there's that balance of protecting um, the passive element. So um, um, can I speak to that for a second? Yes. yes. So um, I'm not sure if I made that comment in the presentation or where that comment was made, but we did intentionally separate out trails as more of an open space recreational element and keep that in the parks, uh, recreation and public facilities section or element mm -hmm. um, versus the access and mobility element, which addresses more of a transportation facility. Um, so we did work with parks and recreation, uh, 
Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Cultural Services Department to um, kind of figure out what the policies, where the delineation of those policies would be. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that they have a lot of work to do with regard to identifying trails and maintaining them and um, making sure that they aren't um, overutilized or um, not to say abused, but used for the wrong purposes. Um, so I, we tr did try to be conscious of that. We don't um, have a, in this update to have a trails master plan or anything that identifies specific trails. Um, but I know that that is on the, the radar for park staff. Well, I should mention that there has been plenty of work done on it in the past and those documents still ex exist for a trails master plan. And I think I brought that up. There are a lot of places in the county and the rural area like railroad access, railroad track, for example, along Zyani where people use it to walk their dogs and walk. So it is essentially uh, a trail corridor. Um, that's the kind of thing I was was meaning. And the idea was to see if you could get people from one park from one park area to another. They're called kind of linear parks. Um, in other communities, it's common, and they they are not with all within the parks department. But I I didn't want to get off go off track. And then with passive uh, recreation that nowadays includes bikes, for better or for worse. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with the in concept that these are really helpful connecting pieces between land elements and sustainable communities. It's a very helpful thing. And um, I think ultimately, when you try to do something like that, you need to be able to have some caveats in there to protect an open space element that is definitely not, should not be part of something like that because there's, elements in there. And when you start changing the general plan, sometimes those elements fall off and the protection elements fall off. So I think I'm just putting this in as a comment of an awareness and, and with no specifics, just that it's there and that it could be extremely problematic. Um, well, well, one more comment. We don't have a lot of large open spaces, but up the North Coast we do. And I think what I was meaning is you, you want to have trail access put down when you develop the property so people can get through them if they're large open spaces. And that's just part of a planning process. Yeah. All right. So, um, and then another, um, let's see. Um, all right. That's it for now, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Sheridan. Commissioner Violante. Yes, thank you, Chair Dan. I just had a, a couple of questions that I was hoping that we could that I could um, ask the of staff. One of which, and I just want to pull up my notes here. Um, I, I had a question on that the same chart that I, I think it was um, Commissioner Shepard was asking about on page eleven, um, in reference to the TDM. Um, when it's talking about the proposed changes, it says that the way that the staff is proposing essentially um, reducing the size of development to be consistent with some of the actions of the board from 25 down to 10. But the way they're saying that this development can come into compliance was to choose from a list of strategies listed in an appendix to the general plan. And I apologize if I just missed it. No, it I, wasn't. I didn't see it either. I, I was... I thought it was valuable to have access to that list because the way in which um, developers um, could 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 come into compliance with that TDM and and select from that list and that appendix was was I, I thought to be a valuable piece of information and I I'm glad to hear I wasn't the only one that couldn't find it. Um, I mean, it, it said it should be listed as an appendix to the um, general plan and I didn't see it on the project website and so I don't. I don't know it if hasn't it can be provided next time, or if you guys could even provide. It sounds like maybe it hasn't been crafted. If you guys could provide yeah. um, what that might look like, though, because I think it's really important when you're talking about, especially lowering that threshold, that any development ten or less would have to meet these standards. I think it's really important to know what um, I don't want to use the word burden, but what requirement would we be placing on developers um, that are building ten units or 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 more in our county? Because I. 
I, I think the direction from the board with the 10 units of, or, or, or more with the, the change in the parking was actually to actually make development easier. And if we're putting this other one, I wanna make sure we're creating a balance because I think we, we, we were making recommendation back to the board about, well, we, we made this to be consistent with your previous recommendation, but we might be um, saddling developers with this other TDM requirement. I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm informed anyway about what that looks like and what I'm what I'm making the recommendation back to the board. So I understand if it hasn't been created yet, but it would be helpful for me um, if when you come back, you could give examples of what that might look like, give us a sense of what that might include. Because for me, um, not having a whole appendix of the general plan uh, feels like I'm making a decision with an incomplete picture. So that would, that would be helpful um, with a question I had. So um, thank you for letting me know I just didn't try and just miss it because this is such a big package. I easily could have just missed a whole, a whole appendix, to be honest. Um, the other question I, I still have that I, I'm, I'm still, I, I would, I know I don't want to beat it to death now, but I still would really like clarity on that portfolio question. I, I would like to better understand really what we are saying we want for the future. The Portola plan is so clearly called out in the general plan and in their sustainability plan here um, that I want to make sure I understand what recommendation are we as a planning commission and, and therefore and then the board ultimately creating as a vision and then saying we want as a community moving forward. I, I want to really better understand. So if you guys could come back to us. I, I, I know that there is some planning language with this planning line stuff, but I, I would like to really better understand, are we just saying we want sustainable transportation in there? That's just too vague. So what 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 parameters are we saying we're looking for? Because I know that there are, it, it was an imperfect pilot program, but I also know that the iterative response to that was that it didn't increase track in the bicycle transportation. And it, like, even if we set aside the fact that it had some obstacles with being able to stay in place, let's say. It's a polite way of putting it. Um, but we it didn't create the results that we wanted, right? It didn't create increased bicycle transportation, um, which is what we would have expected. And so I would like to better understand what is it we as a commission are saying and what is it that we are saying as a community that we think sustainability looks like in that quarter because it's so specifically called out. Um, I would like to better understand when we come back. Um, what the planning staff feels that's part is supposed to say um, and what statement is the board saying because I think it's a really important piece of the transportation quarter just just similarly like with our um, the, the portion we did last time when it came to zoning we had very specific um, language about what do we think the medical corridor is we had we had rules we have a vision I feel like the plot the portal piece is called out means that we have a vision for this piece of the community and I just for me it would really help in making a decision to better understand what what you guys feel this language means um, so that I can make a recommendation in, in the end so those are the two things that I would really like clarity on um, for this piece and I appreciate you listening thank you um, do you have any other questions or comments Commissioner Vila? No, thank you. Okay, um, so I have a few, and but um, I the first one was Portola Drive, and so I want to thank Commissioner Violanti for articulating um, pretty much exactly what my comments on that are as well. So I don't need to go over that one. Um, so one of the things, and first I just want to start by thanking you all for the tremendous amount of work that went into this staff report, um, and. Uh, the level of, of interest that we all have in this and the public, I think is that this is one of the more important um, elements of the plan um, that we're gonna be considering. And when um, when we have development projects, uh, one of the main things we always hear about is parking and traffic. So it's of no surprise that this is um, probably one of the, the sections of this proposed update that's gonna receive the most attention. So. Um, lucky you guys. So one of the things I just wanted to say in general um, is that there's a lot of um, a lot of aspiration in the plan, which is good. I mean, planners, policy planners should be aspirational and looking to the future. Um, so, but some of the things I think we need to think about um, a little bit differently. And one of the items that um, struck me was that 
um, like I'll just use, for instance, with the VMT discussion on um, page 10, um, there's a lot of reference to moving to VMT will reduce uh, cars on the road and um, reduce cars on the road will reduce greenhouse gases, but there's no visioning or um, taking into account that we are moving pretty rapidly to electric cars. And I just read of um, something when I was reading this item, I started looking about what are the projections for electric cars in the future? Well, by 2040, um, pretty much all of the things I've read seem to be there's some, an agreement that at least 30%, some projections are even higher, um, will be electric cars. So I do think that we need to take that into account when we're talking about um, cars being responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, that's gonna change um, in the future. And so I think that this in general um, needs to think about how we're all, not just cars, buses, everything, moving to electric and um, not hang our, so we're not gonna be able to hang our hat entirely on, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions because we're getting cars off the road. Well, greenhouse gas emissions are gonna go down anyway because most of the cars are gonna be electric in 50 years. Um, so that was that. And then I had um, I had a question about um, the TDM and Renee actually was bringing up some of my questions, but then what came out from Renee's question was that we um, don't have a high quality transit um, system as defined right now. And so that wasn't made clear in the staff report that came out as a result of Mr. Shepard's um, question. So I think that's really significant and needs to be acknowledged um, um, in the plan documents. Because when I was reading this, you know, I was questioning like, well, geez, is, you know, our metro, is that gonna, is, are we, are we, uh, are we a high quality transit system? And then later on, on page 11, it kind of implies that we're not, but it doesn't really say that. It says, you know, if we, uh, we're gonna, the element includes new policies that support the development of high quality transit. Um, so I just think that this needs to be um, spelled out a little bit more grounded in reality in that um, we currently don't have um, a high quality transit system. And so we have to also think realistically, are we going to be able to get there? Because if we can't get there, then that cannot be a component um, of the TDM, right? I mean, we can't like, it's, we can't, you know, uh, you know, we can't hang our hat on like, like giving developers of less parking and giving them bus passes. There's no bus stop near them or there is a bus stop, but the bus only comes every half hour and that's just not gonna work for people to get to school or, or to the job. Um, so I think that that needs to be, and it wasn't clear to me. So when that's, um, as moving forward um, in this process, I, I would like that to be a little bit more clear, both for the commission and, and for the public. Um, Okay, I did have some questions about the employer, the proposal to um, require um, employers with 50 or more employees to implement a TDM program. I'm not opposed to this. Um, I think this needs to, um, we need to know more about it. And then more importantly, my question on this is, has there been outreach to those companies that have 50 or more employees to find out um, how this is going to affect them. Because looking at the chart, it looks like what might be ex expected is to hire a transportation consultant or they have hire a staff person to manage this like they do up at UCSC. UCSC, though, is a behemoth organization with 2,000 plus employees. But if you're, uh, you, know, um, you know, a mid-sized retail store downtown with 55 employees, that's a big ask. So I'd like to know if um, there's been outreach to those employers. So this is a requirement for new development or at enlargement of development. Um, the transportation coordinator requirement can be met by working with the RTC. 
Um, they provide a free program or low cost program through Ecology Action. Uh, so you don't actually have to hire a full-time person or even a part-time person. You can pay for this program through Ecology Action. The um, And I also would like to get to... Um, That's for the 200 plus employees? So does that mean... Right. That you only can, means if there's a new company coming in? So like New or enlargement of development. Um, so the, and I would also like to get to, to Commissioner Violante's question because this is related. I think that the, um, the TDM and, and VMT requirements are complex. And so I'll just, I'll break it down a little bit more, which is that all of these requirements are like a menu of options. They're not, um, if you're a small, residential development with 10 units, um, the list that's referenced, which has not been created yet, um, would not, you would not be required to implement all of the things on the list. You would be required to pick and choose to reduce your VMT down to the threshold that's required by our adopted uh, code, uh, or sorry, by our adopted regulations. Um, the regulations are driven by state law to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions acknowledge that more electric vehicles are coming online, also per state law. That does not negate the former state law, which requires us to uh, regulate and um, reduce VMT on a project level basis based on regional goals. Um, so that said, uh, the TDM reductions, we have gotten the comment that they need to be simplified from uh, supervisors. So we are looking at that and that little table is partly to say, we know we need to simplify this in the code, the proposed code um, to make it easier to understand. Um, the intent is to make it as easy as possible to implement while also requiring TDM to be something that's done at, um, at the point of building your project as a self mitigating strategy so that you don't have, so the developer has less impacts when they come into the environmental review process. Okay, thank you for that. You know, um, so I'm, I'm still unclear though about the um, proposed requirements for, there's 50 to 200 employees and then 200 plus employees. And so you indicated it's for new development. So does this mean if you have company X that is here, that's 200 employees and we don't have that many of them um, and they want to expand a building, then this would be a requirement on them? Or? If they came in for a permit to expand a building, correct. Now- so if you're company X and you just have 200 employees right now, you don't have to implement this program. We don't have the resources to do that, right? Okay, so so that, yeah. should, that if that could be made clear, so if your company acts and you're reading this, you know, oh, actually this is not gonna apply to me. It's only gonna apply to me if I expand to this building over here. Um, that that would be helpful to, to have made clear. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, moving on. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have, yeah. uh, I have an engagement I'm late for and I have to leave. Uh, I don't know how that affects things, and I don't think you're having any vote, But and I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, okay, thank you, Lisa. I wrote down your comments, so we'll summarize them at the end. Thanks so much. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Yeah, really okay. Um, okay, now I just have a couple more um, comments about, about parking. Um, so on the chart on page 13 that other folks had referred to, um, why is the park? Why are the parking requirements different for multifamily than single family? So, as I was saying in that presentation, maybe not clearly enough, we're trying to uh, tie them to square footage. We're tying them to square footage to try to incentivize or assist developers who want to build small, smaller units um, to not have to eat up so much land with parking. So in other words, it's it's allowing people to to design smaller homes without having the, to build out the same amount of parking. So, I mean, I think that's a really worthy goal. Um, from my perspective, I also think that we need to build 
multifamily developments that actually will serve families. And so that, you know, that does mean um, a higher bedroom count. And also, you know, I think that one of the things we should think about is if we, you know, we're going to have to build up and, and, and at higher density, but we also want not just singles and students to be able to live there, but we want families to see that as a desirable place to live so that we can sustain our community. And so I think that, you know, one of the things I think is a tough one to think about, because I understand what you're saying, and I think that is correct. Developers prefer to have lower parking requirements to facilitate their project. However, at the same time, when we're thinking about building different types of housing for different types of uses and families and um, having fewer parking spaces makes that development less desirable for, for families. Um, and that, so I, I mean, I think it's just like a philosophical kind of question that, you know, the commission here and then of course the board we're, is going to have to be grappling with. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure the direction is going to be in lowering parking standards, but at the same time, that makes it tougher for if you're a family of four to um, choose to move into that multifamily development, if your parking is gonna be constrained and then it's gonna be in a higher density area where parking is already hard to find. And you know, in lower density, single family home neighborhoods, it's pretty much easier to find parking. So it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm okay with it with the single family homes because we kind of have a lower density um, unincorporated area. But um, if we're gonna be building up, I think we also have to think about, um, you know, building, creating spaces um, for, you know, different types, not just singles and students and, um, but for people with kids and, and families and higher and more people in their household. Um, so I'll be thinking more about that. And it's also the reason why I harp on making sure we um, incentivize more open space. It's for the same exact reason so that um, people see those places as a, as a desirable place to raise a family. Commissioner, uh, then can I just add something to what you're speaking about? Sure. Um, right now we are really encouraging um, accessory dwelling units. So for new construction, we're going to see a lot with uh, accessory dwelling unit and a junior accessory dwelling unit. But the new parking requirements is, how do they fit in? The accessory dwelling unit parking requirements are actually regulated by state law. So we cannot require more than one parking space for an accessory dwelling unit. And if it's within a half mile of any public transit spot, stop, we cannot require a space at all. Just to add to that, and maybe to circle back to the comment about parking in the coastal areas, we do have, we are able to kind of address the um, Coastal Act and do have different parking standards, higher parking standards for ADUs that are in the coastal areas, the designated areas, the Salzda, Dazda, Loda. Right. So the way the state laws is, even if the bus in my area, this is the case, comes every hour, they can still not have a parking space. Right. Unless it's in a coastal zone. Yeah. And, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I was just also going to say that um, for the multifamily comments regarding multifamily, um, you know, we do see mix, it's really a mixture of housing units that get built in, in multifamily. So it's not I don't expect that it would just be all small unit developments, but a, a mixture. Um, and so the parking requirements are structured as, um, as I'm sure you know, they're they're structured so that if it's under, it would be under, if under 750 would be one space and then over 750 would meet a different requirement. Um, and then there's also guest parking still built in. Um, so we did try to account for having a mixture of sizes of units in a, a single development. I appreciate that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. It's been a long day. Um, but and I really appreciate all of the, the work that went into this. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more. I, uh, I had one more question or comment on that appendix that we know you mentioned you haven't made up yet. I, I don't see how we really, when we come back, I don't really see how I can 
usefully address this without knowing what kind of things constitute are going to be on that appendix for developers to choose from. I have zero idea and it's such a core principle in this plan. I'd, I'd really like to like to see that. So and it's <clears throat> it actually the basis of it already exists as the um, the county's VMT guidelines, um, which are the adopted guidelines for um, our VMT thresholds that we have to implement for any uh, project that's subject to CEQA. Those are available on the um, planning department's website. Um, we might have to send out a link separately because they're, I have to describe to you how to navigate to them since we've been making so many changes to our website right now. Um, I'm just but, saying when you bring this back, we'd like to see it. I don't, yes. I don't want to spend another half an hour trying to find it. Yeah, okay. I would suggest, you know, at least before the August meetings when we are to take direction. And then I, you know, for me, one of the other general comments is that, as I think it was mentioned by another commissioner, is the most important part of this document group <laughs> that for us to look out, look at are going to be the strike through versions of the code. And I understand that, um, you know, there's a lot to print, and so you don't want to give that to us. So, you know, I'm going to be just printing them all out myself. So, but if the staff wants to print those for the commission, I think it's really critical. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road is the, the strikeout version of, of the chapter 13. I, I, have, to, two, yeah. I have to say, when, when, I my con, when my constituents come to me, they have the current code, and they have the strikeout version, what's proposed means I can explain things clearly and people can understand clearly because people don't go to the planning commission very often, the planning department very often. So they may know what it was 10 years ago. So having what it was and what it is, I, I would agree. I think that's going to be a document that we'll keep and make use of and maybe save you guys some time and trouble later on. Yes. So and what I was going to finish saying was that I understand it is available. So it is available online and, and I have been looking at it but um, it's, it hasn't been super helpful to me to just look out online. And so I will be printing them myself. <laughs> um, so, I just, so I just wanted to put that out there. It's, it's quite a lot to print. So maybe you could consider and then let us know by email after you've talked about it amongst your staff, whether or not that's something that you could provide to the commission. I'd pay, uh, for, I'd pay for getting it if, you, if that's the <laughs> issue. Um, we we held off. It's thousands of pages, right? So um, in making them available online gives the commissioners an opportunity to really choose which part of this massive project you want to look at. If you if you're requesting that we print hard copies of the general plan or maybe just the strikeout version of the code, we can we can do that. It takes, you know, takes about 10 days to make it happen. We won't charge you for them because it's probably, I don't know, $300 a pot, but we can, we can do that. You know, we're trying to save some trees and uh, trying to save poor Michael Lamb <laughs> having to, uh, to do that. But if, if that's what the commission wants, that's fine. I mean, for me, I was really having the strike through version of the code is what would be helpful. And, and I also wanted to save you from all of the things you've just mentioned. Um, is the, is the, just the code changes a thousand pages? Because if, if that's the case, I almost feel like that's, <laughs> that's a whole other separate issue maybe. Um, it's just pretty hard to navigate online especially if you don't know, to, as you say, the county site changes all the time. Not everything works. It depends on what browser you work. I really want to be able to have this as a, as a reference. That's all. And I agree. It is the code changes. We're happy to pr provide you with the code changes and strike through in paper, if, if that's what you're asking for. Um, the, the project documents are available in one specific place that has been available since end of February is not broken down. Uh, we just added one appendix to it. it hasn't changed. It, you know, it's all been there. Um, and I realize 
do realize this is very different from what the commission is used to. It is for us also, um, but there is there shouldn't at this point. I hope there isn't any confusion about where to find the documents. They they are um, there. I think your website is great. I I think it's really well done, and all the documents are right there listed with the link to each one, and that's right. that's been great and super helpful. But now, like, I feel like, at least for me, I'm getting to the point where I actually have to start really thinking specifically about what's being changed. And so when I get to that point, that's when I usually like to specifically look at what exactly is being changed in the code and not just kind of like what is described or theoretical. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that's we order those and make them available for your next meeting. And that would be great. Just want to express my appreciation because I do, and, and I really am hoping it's not a thousand pages of code changes. It might be. It's possible. The underline and strike through, you know, tend to get really yeah. long because you've got well, both the true. existing that's and the right. So it's like two codes, two sets of codes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But that that's fine. You can do that. Okay, I really appreciate you. Um yeah, now just to be clear, the what we'll print is what is out there for public review now. It it won't have any of the changes that we've been talking about. I think we'll have to kind of take the commission's action and incorporate that into the next draft that that we make available that you'll have for ordinances as we go so, to public hearing. So are you still iterating then and making revisions to the to we like, have, we to are the just starting right now to we have not done any other iterations we wanted to get to the commission um consider the public comment that we've heard consider the commission's comments and feedback and then per, uh and then prepare the new drafts mm. that would appear um in the ordinances for your recommendation so I can I can make the print copies happen, but they'll, just so you know, it's what's out there now, not what we're preparing for the ordinances. So will not reflect the comments that you've had since we've been meeting together on these study sessions. That's fine with me. Okay. Hey, I guess I'd like to hear from Allison what you think. I mean, you know, if I'm gonna, we're gonna ask to print the codes, I guess I'd rather know, see them right before, you know, see the final version, like your final version. I, I just wanna have enough time to really look at it, that's all. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. I mean, you know, I know I don't do this for a living, so I have to set aside a lot of time to do it. And I, I really want to be able to do that. This is very important um, in my role as a planning commissioner. Um, and I still work full time, so I just want it. And I don't, it to me, just getting either the current version or the revised one, as long as we have time to look at it, it's fine. Yeah, I was going to say our last planning, our study session is July 13th, correct? And then we don't have another hearing. We start our hearings on August 24th. Yeah. So we, a month between. We, we, put, we put out there um, we're, the question of whether the commission wanted to schedule an additional study session to return to some of these issues um because uh i think we're getting getting some comments but we're not necessarily coming to resolution on how the commission would want to see the change so there's two ways to go um we could stud schedule another study session um i'd have to recommend that it be on july 27th or if that's inconvenient maybe a special session on the first week of august um, in order for us to have enough time to prepare the the ordinances. No, no, I, I apologize. I wasn't I wasn't clear with my point of my comment. I I, I, sh I share Chair Dan's concern about spending a significant amount of time dedicated to reading a thousand pages of changed code, only to have it not really be the version we're considering. Um, and so I was trying to understand the duration of time between our our next study session and when we would actually be considering the, the the actual code is what I was trying to make sure I understood our timeline. Uh, so I apologize. I'm not yes. suggesting we have another study session. Oh, okay. No, no problem. <laughs> no, I was trying to understand timeline, so I apologize. Yeah, for not being we're, clear we're in my trying. Question. We're trying to come um, back with ordinances on August 24th. 
Yeah, so that, that's what I was trying to understand. There's about a month, yeah. um, as it, but that also assumes that you're not going to make additional additions based on that. Um, that that July 13th. Um, July 13th is to finish up these study sessions, go yeah. over the code mod and what's in there. Um, and then at, at that point, if we're not going to have another study session, we'll be diligently working to um, modify these drafts. Um, to address comments that we um, that we heard from the commission and and the public, um, or the direction we got, for instance, from the board on the TDM um, One, um, item. Um, well, but on the thirteenth, how many other items do we have? On the thirteenth, mm -hmm. we have a big agenda. You thought this one was big. This is the code mods, which is a lot of what's happening in the code changes and uh, changes to agriculture and natural resources. There's not too much in natural resources. Um, and then we're going to do an overview of what's in the EIR so that you're aware. Well, I wouldn't be willing to break it up and have a meeting in late July. I guess my concern is I want to make sure we whatever we're reading, I want to make sure it's the final version. I don't I, I, I don't know that it serves the commission to spend hours reading code that is not really what's going to be before us whenever we take it up. I almost, if, if the timeline hadn't been so public, I, I almost would recommend that we push out our hearing on this in order to give us time to read. Since you are making changes, it's, I, and I, I don't know that it's even possible given that we've published published our, our hearing timeline at this point, but it, I almost, given that you are making changes, there are revisions and I want to make sure the commission, I mean, for my own comfort, and I, I don't know, again, I don't even know if this is possible given that we've made our timeline public. Well, I um, agree. This is probably one of the most important things we'll do for many years. I don't want to try and do it, see how fast I can get through it. That's not the way I want to do this. It's almost like I would, and I, and I don't know, Stephanie, seeing your face, like how, how possible that is, because if there's going to be revisions to this huge package, I'd rather have us dedicate the time to reading the final code, what your the changes to staff is making based on the, the input we've provided, and give us the extra couple weeks to, to not have our first hearing until I don't I'm not talking about adding a meeting. I'm almost talking about del, like del, delay, delaying until like September 14th being our first hearing or, or something like that. Again, I don't know if that's even feasible or legal given that we've already published these timelines, but I'd rather have the commission, and I obviously would like to hear my fellow commissioner's input. I'm sorry that there's only two other ones of them here today about this idea that there, you know, that if, that if you guys are still in the iterative process, I, I don't, I'd rather not waste my colleagues time reading code that's still changing. I don't know, Commissioner Daniel. Or I totally not. agree with that. I would rather just get a printout of the final uh, code changes and as, you know, as far in advance to, to the August 24th hearing as, as you can do that would be great. Knowing that we have another opportunity, I think, September 14th to make a final recommendation. Um, so, yeah, that, that I agree with the Commissioner Bielanti. Okay. I, I, I would agree, too, as long as, you know, I think that's, that's a plan. If we have to, we notice something, well, then that's still possible. Okay, yeah. so I think, does that, is that somewhat clear, <laughs> Stephanie? Thank you, yeah. I, I guess what I wanted to say is that um, staff, staff has some corrections. You know, we've seen some errors, perhaps cross-references aren't correct, that, that kind of thing. Um, we, the more substantive changes are anything that's happening at this commission. So. Um, there wouldn't be wouldn't be all new material. Uh, this is like, oh, we never saw this before. We never talked about this before. You know, we we're thinking if you're if the commission is unhappy with this parking standard or whatever that that standard would change, we would highlight that piece. I, I just wanted to say that these are not um, documents that are going through big rounds of changes. You know, as you're reviewing them, just so you know. To help with that, my recommendation um, to staff would be that when you do provide us with the with kind of the final version, that you use a double strikeout underlined version so that we can choose to start reading it now. 
Um, and, and, and that we would know come the version you ultimately provide us, what changes are based on our own comments so that we can, if we, this provides us the longest timeline in advance so that if we choose yeah. to read the code now, we can. And then when you do provide us the ultimate um, version that we know the by using the strikeout, the double strikeout underlying version, um, we would know that these are changes Right. Since then, so right. if, if you if your staff if staff is amenable to that, I, that would be my recommendation. It would make it easier for me in reading the code because, like for example, the um, I agree. The, that's a the, great. That's a good idea. The aux item I actually found difficult to read because they had like blue and red changes in the staff item, and I was like, well, are these all changes? But if they just used this double strikeout underlying version, it would have been helpful for for me. Can what I just you, chime oh. in for a second? Uh, you know, this is riveting conversation. Um, and definitely something that I spend a lot of time doing is pouring over the code. So, um, you know, the only changes that are gonna happen are gonna come from my office at this point. Um, they, Stephanie is, and her team have handed them off to me to review. Um, and um, creating a brand new version that is a clean version that incorporates the changes that you have made I think would be um, it's doable given that it's probably not going to be a lot, right? And I mean, the changes that you're going to pro to you're going to propose are going to be probably not that lengthy, I would imagine, right? So, I think we could provide copies of a new strike through underline with that, with just those specific sections, right? Because as you've heard and as we've been talking about, I mean, these are thousands of pages. It's very, very long. Um, this is just an incredible lift for all of you, for staff, for everybody. And um, I just wanna be cognizant of creating new versions of of things that, so just that you know that, you know, it would just be those sections that you touch. And, um, but I think if we're going to be kind of editing the code and as, as I think is your duty, right, as commissioners is to go through and, and propose edits and suggestions, um, then yeah, another study session makes a lot of sense. But it, it's something that I would urge you to begin now, um, just if you haven't already, is looking, it's, it's, it's very dense, it's very long, tedious work. <laughs> and so as somebody who's been doing it um, for weeks, it's just, uh, I don't know, how much time you're going to have to really go through each and every page. But um, yeah, it's like Stephanie said, we're not going to be making substantive changes. So what exists now online is pretty much what it's going to look like. Um, and those substantive changes that are going to be, that are going to be incorporated are going to come from this body. Daniel, what about the using the double underline suggestion? I think that's a good idea and doable. Um, go, sorry, um, Commissioner Shepard, yeah, the double underline meaning the changes that you all have made, is that what you're suggesting? Is that well, what that is? we haven't made any changes, so what, we're yeah. just giving general feedback. So any changes will be staff's iterative changes from what's already posted online right now. In we won't make any changes until August 24. But it yeah, so I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, is um, Commissioner Shepard's suggestion that there be double underline. So what are we talking about when we say double underline? Well, Stephanie, why don't you explain again? Um, no, I don't want to speak to Allison, but I I'm think sorry, what we were trying Allison, to, Allison trying to was, do is to highlight changes that have been made since the version you've already looked at. Right. So um, there's, whether that's double underline or highlighting or how, however that happens, but so it's real clear. To, to you what has changed since the version that was prepared. I think that was the concept. Well, when I look at legal uh, contracts in my business, that's what we, the double underline shows you what's been changed since the last version. I think that'll work. So I think the, the concept was we should all get going on digging into the code now, but that uh, at a certain, after the conclusion of our study session, staff will be working diligently to make any additional modifications to the code. And once, as soon as that's complete, they're gonna make that available to us in the double strikeout version in paper. 
prior to the August 24th meeting. Does that represent what we all discussed? Yeah, if I can clarify just for a second, what you're saying is that after the study sessions end, staff will then take whatever conversation. So I haven't heard anything yet that was kind of a proposed change, right? So I haven't heard well, anything yeah. at this point. I just so. said that because um, they, staff indicated that they, they would be making changes to what's already posted online. If that's not gonna happen, then we can get a printed version of the code right now. But I think what Allison and I were trying to avoid was you know, getting a printed vote version of the code now and pouring through it, but then what actually is in our on our agenda packet for the 24th is something different because staff is still iterating on the code. And staff's not iterating. Staff oh. is making corrections and would be addressing the commission's comments. <laughs> Daniel may iterate. It would just be my iterations, but I, it won't be substantive. If I have any, if I come across anything that needs substantive change, I will bring it to the commission and you will know about it. Well, let but, me get a if you don't mind an example of what you were saying, for for example, next session on the 13th, we're going to talk about one of my, we're going to talk about fences and we're going to talk about large animal regulations. So on large animal regulations code, I've met with the 4-H people, I've met with the horsemen and I've met with groups and showed them the proposed changes to the code and they had suggestions that I think I would like to bring back. So I will be making specific suggestions. In this, I feel like I just expressed my reaction to and uh, thoughts on the code, but it, on what we were looking at in this, but we, because we haven't been looking at code. So uh, I, I still think that that could be a double strikeout version is what I was talking about after the 13th. So, ba so based on Daniel's comments, it sounds like there are not going to be changes by staff at this time. There are simply going to be what I'm gonna call small edits and that the majority of the code is not is going to stay the same. And, and Daniel, based on what you said originally, it almost sounds like you would recommend the code be printed now and that you could bring us a small, small packet Book. or page. Yeah, I don't know what to call it, of like of 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 the, the, the places where the change occurred. And that would be at least what I what it sounded like from you when you decided to, to weigh in here is that your recommendation was that the code be printed now and that you would be willing to provide us with, with the same way when we make changes, even on one of our earlier items, when we make changes to these larger portions of code, we don't actually bring back the big code. We just bring like the little pieces where the changes are made. And it sounds like if I was hearing you correctly, it sounded like that was almost your recommendation, which is have staff print the code now. And you, since you'd be the one making the changes would bring us back the locations where those changes occurred. Did I did I understand you? Yeah, I, I think that, that yeah, I think that could that could work. Um I wouldn't I'm not advocating for printing out any pages just because that's not what I can I okay, I won't recommend printing out wanted. all those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So but if, if you so desired to have a hard copy of these of this text, then yes, now would be a good time to do it and to make your notations on the text so that next time we talk about these code changes, we can actually get down to, you know, your changes, your edits, suggestions, and so forth. I would be okay with that. That's what we the print, posting. Yeah, but the printing just, I don't know how much time will be needed. Stephanie, you mentioned a couple of weeks to get that underway, correct? Are we talking about just the strike through version of the code yeah yeah not the general plan yeah just okay. just the code we yeah. are all interested Prob in the code I probably mean, about a week once i order it up and i don't know if this is possible either but if it could be like tabbed by like <laughs> section would be extremely helpful but now i'm just it might be another week okay <laughs> Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. I know it's a big ask, but I just don't see any way for me, at least around it. I was going to either print it myself or, but you know. It's, yeah, it's only once every 20 years. Yeah, more than that, actually. It's been quite nice since 1994, right? So, okay. Yeah, and this, this is our biggest responsibility. We want to do, you know, I think we really all want to um, do it right. Well, my, my recommendation on that is to not wait 
another 20 years and to do it in smaller iterations over time and when something comes back um, to to fix it. Uh, I just I have to say that this isn't going to be perfect. I want I want to temper your expectations that this process isn't going to be perfect. The code is not going to be perfect, and all of the, our wishes and, and wants of of sustainability are not going to be perfect. But that shouldn't hold us back from actually passing something forward to the board. Um, so we need to. I don't want you to rush, but I want you to understand that this isn't the end, um, and that we're 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 diligently going through this material. And um, it's a lot, and it shouldn't. We shouldn't uh, have to ask you to do this again for another twenty years. But at the same time, you know, smaller chunks next time, I hope. Um, but yeah, this is. It, there's going to be some some pains in here, I think. Um, just hearing the the parking um, pieces, um, but yeah, yeah, I think you'll okay. understand that piece. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And so let's uh, conclude this item and then um, move on for our last three kind of cleanup items. Is there a planning director's report? Um, if you don't mind, before you go on, I'm sorry, I left two things out of my comments. There were a lot of feedback about why don't we consider Dutch intersections for our meeting? Could you tell me what a Dutch intersection is? Because a lot of people talked about it for the next meeting and then one suggestion I thought was a good idea to consider is tree removal permits for trees over a certain size. We've never had that in our court. A lot of other places do. I'd like to get some feedback on, on that, I'm looking at what people suggested. A lot of people think we have a tree removal process, but we don't. And maybe we should for large uh, you know, heritage trees. Oh, sorry, that was just the little small items from going back to the big thing. And then I had one overall comment. I understand that you that the part of the issue has become since the last 20 years, or the last five years, or the last 10 years, is a lot of the general plan is just getting the county in accordance with state uh, laws and changes in policy. But it feels more and more that the state's running the show and the county just figures out how to accord itself to the state. And I, I'm hoping that when we finish this document, we'll have some vision about Santa Cruz County and what we want to be here, even though we are so much more directed and controlled by state policies. I want this to be a, a Santa Cruz document. I don't feel that coming out of any of the language. It's more like, well, we have to be in accord with the state here and the state there and the bigger issues. But what is it that makes this place unique and is the reason everybody lives there? There's a vision statement in the introduction of the general Maybe plan, I just haven't Renee. Seen it. Yeah, yeah, that um, was built from and very closely resembles resembles what was in the sustainable Santa Cruz plan. Thank so, you. You're welcome. I need to go look at it. Okay. It is just really <laughs> difficult to access this all, and yeah. I can only spend so many hours in front of a computer. So that, I think having the thing yeah. to carry around with me physically, because I'll carry this around with me. And, look at it whenever I can. Thanks, Renee. Friend, then we got to move along here. So um, let's wrap this up and move right. along. So uh, is there a planning director's report? There's um, no report today. Okay. Uh, is there a report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas? You kind of gave us an overview already of July 15th. Uh, yes, I can do that. Um, the um, the next agenda is on July 13th, and um, we have a project as, uh, that I shall actually be bringing for a minor land division that is on Center Street in uh, Soquel. And there's also an appeal of a cannabis item um, that will be coming to the commission. And then, of course, we do have a, a study session. Uh, right now, we don't have anything on the agenda for July 27th, um, other than I think there was a potential that we were going to have a, a further study session, um, which I'm not quite sure whether we have landed on whether that's going to happen yet. Um, but there's no other scheduled items at this time. Is that cannabis item the one that's returning to us about up in my district? Yes, it's on Old Mount Road. Okay. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, is there, um, yes, would now be the appropriate time to ask that we have the discussion about the minutes come back on the regular agenda. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that gets captured as well. Well, oh, you're you're jumping the gun there, Chair. Sorry. I mean, uh, Commissioner Violante. I'm going to address right. that in just <laughs> just a moment. 
<laughs> okay, perfect. So just, yeah. just we were discussing upcoming agenda uh, items. Thank you. Yeah, are we ready for my uh, report? We are ready. Well, I am happy to report that I consulted my Sturgis. You can't really see it very well. Standard code parliamentary procedure. Doesn't. Sorry for the filter. Anyway, um, so the Planning Commission is under the Sturgis rules of parliamentary procedure, and I will read from the approval of the minutes, and you'll be happy to note that uh, no motion is even necessary to approve minutes. So you, the board um, can can entertain minutes. So if there are no corrections after or after all corrections have been made, the presiding officer should state, quote, if there are no corrections or further corrections, the minutes are approved as read or as corrected. And that is all is needed by general consent. So if, um, if the chair does not say if there are any, if there are no corrections, the minutes are approved. If the chair does not say that, then a motion can be entertained to approve the minutes. But um, I read that to also mean that you do not need to be in attendance to approve the minutes. Um, something like that has just never come up. Um, also means that if you weren't in attendance, uh, you're, uh, you know, if you were in attendance and then the next meeting, you won't be able to correct anything in the minutes. But let's be honest, nobody really ever corrects anything in the minutes other than spelling and grammatical errors anyway. So that being said, we can um, talk about if you want uh, if you want to agendize something for next meeting about whether or not to move them to consent. Um, all that's really needed from the chair is to ask for corrections and if there are no corrections to basically say they've been approved by general consent. Um, and if anybody, you know, they can voice their corrections. So I don't know if it matters. I mean, Commissioner Violante, you can you can kind of speak to this if you wish as far as whether or not minutes should be on consent or not. They will likely be treated the same way uh, going forward if they're on consent or not. It just sounds like uh, folks need to get a chance to read it and then the chair can really just approve them without a vote. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds good to me. So I would just suggest we let Tim, the chair, know of this procedure so that he can implement it at the next meeting. Yeah, he'll figure it out. I'm just kidding. I'll send him an email. Okay. <laughs> good. I you. will take the responsibility for that one. And um, I will, I'm also happy to report that I will be with you all on July 13th and that will be my last meeting. Okay. Well, as I won't be there on July 13th, but let me wish you well and Thank you. good luck in your new position. We will Thank miss you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to to leave you with uh, such a large project in the middle of it, but I'm going to get done as much as I possibly can before I hand it off to my colleague, Justin Graham, who is more than capable to handle this project. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, I think that concludes our meeting. And um, the, well, the next Planning Commission meeting will be July 13th. And I wish you all a, a great July. I'll see you in August. <laughs>